And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, could I receive the sale price on this cantaloupe if I give it a great big hug first? And with the controversy surrounding Aaron Rodgers, will we still be able to enjoy football games by wearing those amazing cheese-shaped hats while hammered? (laughs) And now, the podcast host who always gets the advice of experts before any major dental hygiene purchases, Pete Dominic. Oh, that's right. I certainly do my research for dental hygiene. Nobody has better dental hygiene than me. Just ask people who know me. They'll tell you that for sure. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Stand Up here Monday through Friday with you along the journey, along the ride. And so happy to have you joining me today. It's it's Wednesday if you're listening along as I do it. The Today is the 10th of November here in the final eight weeks of 2021. I hope that you are hanging in there or even thriving. I hope you're doing great. I am headed into the woods this morning with my friend Dr. Ken Zatz for the second week in a row. We bring our dog. We walk in the woods. Super healthy and very good for our mental health. And speaking of mental health, I have a clinical psychologist and good friend of mine, Dr. Matt Bellis, joins me for the first time on today's show. He's written a book called Life is Disappointing and Other Inspiring Thoughts. And I really had an awesome conversation with Matt. I think you're going to really like it. That is the third of three interviews that I've got on. Before that, it's Dr. Megan May, two doctors on today's show. Of course, Megan May is a microbiology expert and infectious disease expert and we love to talk about infectious diseases but this conversation today is even more fun because she was at the magic kingdom megan may from magic kingdom while she's waiting for her son and husband to come out of magic mountain and it's hilarious for that reason alone she's literally telling me about uh, uh, infectious disease and then interrupts herself she's like i think there's some fake snow coming down I just love everything about her and talking to her. It's always great. And first and form, uh, foremost, is it foremost? Is it? Michael Cohen is joining me, of course, columnist and author of the Truth and Cons Substack, Truth and Consequences, truthandcons.com. And we had a great conversation about the ladies in politics. So three guests. First, Michael Cohen. You want politics? Go to jump to that one. If you want the updates on COVID, and we break down the Aaron Rodgers debunk that and have a good, fun, interesting and informative conversation with Dr. Megan May. That's the second interview. And then I wrap it up with a very personal, thoughtful conversation about mental health with Dr. Matt Bellis. So three great guests. But first, it's time to get to the news. I do have a bit of a news segment for you. I'm not sure how robust or how well put together it is. You can blame Joe Leota for that. Longtime listener and subscriber Joe is a uh, area salesman. And he comes by about once a month and and we have drinks and sometimes we eat. And he took me out last night for like two hours. And I said, Joe, I'm not going to be able to get the news done because of you. But I got it. I'm doing it. I'm trying to get it all in. I'm not sure how great it's going to be, but I do have a bunch of clips for you. Let's get to it right now. The last 24. Hit it. All right. Plenty to discuss on today's program. Howard Stern is teasing a run for president just to piss off uh, Donald Trump. I like that one. The January 6th panel subpoenaed 10 more Trump aides. The prosecution rested its trial in the Rittenhouse trial. Brian Williams announced he's leaving NBC after like 400 years. Court overturned a $465 million opioid ruling against Johnson & Johnson. Senator and veteran Max Cleland died at the age of 79. And so much more I'll get to in more headlines in the news dump. Just wanted to read a few before I share some audio I've got for you so you're as in the know as I can have you be scanning a lot of these headlines. You can look them up, read more about them, but thought this was an interesting conversation yesterday, at least clip from a conversation. Adam Schiff, it was on The View. He's the chairman of the House Intel Committee and congressman representing California's 28th district. Everybody probably knows who Adam Schiff is, right? Well, he said a lot of things, including that Congressman Paul Gozar has no business being 
in Congress. This is an Arizona congressman who shared an altered animated video that depicts him killing AOC and swinging two swords at President Biden. Okay. Well, first of all, he has no business being in Congress. He should have never been elected. He doesn't belong there. Um, and you know, sadly, sadly, the Republican conference is now characterized by numerous kooks and, and dangerous cranks, yes. of which he is one. Uh, and when you consider where you know, the leadership of that conference is, they're talking today about removing from committees Republicans who voted for a bipartisan infrastructure bill. <laughs> Their sin was voting for a bipartisan bill to rebuild our roads and bridges and that highways. That will benefit a lot of their voters. That will benefit a lot of their constituents. Mm -hmm. And why? Why is that such an offense? Because it contradicts their strategy of making Joe Biden a failure. Mm. Uh, if it hurts the American people, they don't care mm. as long as they can make Joe Biden fail. But Paul Gosar uh, creates this, this video glorifying violence against one of our colleagues who's already been the subject of death threats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you were pointing out, they, they are repeatedly glorifying violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not as if this is without the backdrop of the violence of January 6th. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, when they go out and they spread this big lie about the election, and they tell Americans basically, we can't trust our elections anymore, any election we lose is rigged, they're basically saying, if we can't rely on elections to decide who governs, then what's left but violence? Uh, and that's just dangerous. Mm, very dangerous. All right. And here's a little bit more from Adam Schiff. He had a bit of a quarrel with uh, Morgan, uh, Morgan Ortegas. She's a former Trump uh, State Department spokesman. She was also at Treasury, USAID, U.S. Navy Reserve. And she's got a lot of different credits to her name, but boy, uh, this is not very impressive. And I thought Adam Schiff handled it as well as could be expected. Listen to this and then question yourself why she's on the show. But you the may have spread Russian disinformation get... yourself for years by promoting this. I think that's what Republicans and what people who entrusted you as the Intel Committee Chair are so confused about your culpability in all of this. Well, I, I completely disagree with your premise. Uh, it's one thing to say allegations should be investigated, and they were. Mm -hmm. It's another to say that we should have foreseen in advance that some people were lying to Christopher Steele, which is mm -hmm. impossible, of course, to do. But, but let's not use that as a smokescreen to somehow shield Donald Trump's culpability for inviting Russia to help him in the election, which they did, for trying to coerce Ukraine into helping him in the next election, mm. which he did, uh, into inciting an insurrection, uh, insurrection, which he did. Um, none of that is undercut. None of that serious misconduct is in any way diminished by the fact that people lied to Christopher Steele. No, I think just your credibility is. No, well, I think the credibility of your question, <laughs> credibility of your question yeah. uh, is in doubt. All right. I have a question. <laughs> OK, a couple things. Adam Schiff definitely definitely said erection. I don't know if you heard that uh, into inciting an erection uh, insurrection, which he did. I mean, I guess he said in erection, but it definitely sounded like erection. And while she was trying to score points and impress the audience and the producers at The View and executives at ABC, as she's trying to get that slot, clearly, I don't think it was very impressive. And she ran into a bit of a wood chip grinder, which is a pretty smart whip lawyer. Adam Schiff, who has come up against a lot more challenging arguments than that one, which is why he simply said, I think the credibility of your question is in question. Is that what he said? Yeah. Anyway. OK, Adam Schiff of The View, everybody. Now, let's head over to CNN, where Don Lemon had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the NBA legend and intellectual and civil rights activist Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who is always so eloquent and I guess he has a substack now as well, I found out from his appearance there. Anyway, he is calling out what he considers a double standard between athletes like Colin Kaepernick and Aaron Rodgers. Here is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I think there is a double standard. You know, uh, Rodgers is very valuable to the NFL, and he has a lot of fans. And uh, I don't think they're going to do anything of a serious nature to... Uh, to discipline him. 
His lack of responsibility, you know, for his friends, family, team, staff, and fans that he lied to and exposed to COVID-19, it, it shows a lack of moral character that can't be ignored. Now, as far as I can tell, there are very few professional athletes who are more well-respected, at least by the types of po- folks that I respect, than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And, you know, maybe Aaron Rodgers doesn't know about that much about him or what he has accomplished and how outspoken he has always been on the side of righteousness, at least in my opinion. Maybe Aaron Rodgers doesn't care, but boy, I'll tell you what, if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar says, questions your moral character, that is not a great day. I mean, that is, to have that stain on your reputation for the rest of your life, that would be tough, for me at least. But luckily, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has no idea who I am. But let's go back to him, because I certainly do like listen to what he's got to say. Rogers deliberately misled his team and the public with a liable mission. And um, those type of lies really are the type of things that destroy confidence. So as a liar, how can he be trusted to endorse, to endorse products? Worse... He's damaged the uh, image of professional athletes as role models and potentially hurt their financial opportunities as spokespersons. Here's a self-explanatory clip. From, it doesn't need to be set up other than this is Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming. A little short soundbite from a speech she gave yesterday to school. We are also confronting a domestic threat that we have never faced before. A former president who's attempting to unravel the foundations of our constitutional republic. Aided by political leaders who have made themselves willing hostages to this dangerous and irrational man. She keeps pouring it on and not giving up. Gotta respect her for that. And I'm sure she's getting nothing but death threats on a regular basis. But her family is probably fairly used to that because, yeah. All right, let me give you some other random clips from yesterday here on The Last 24. Oh, yeah, this is uh, Paul Gozar, this congressman's sister. And I just, I just, I love these. I mean, it's it's crazy, and I feel sick that I'm entertained by it to some extent. But it is interesting, I think, to some extent important when uh, your, your own sister is calling you out on not one but two networks. That's right. Here is Jennifer Gosar the sister of Paul Gosar, who, of course, shared that anime video, which uh, sh- shows uh, uh, AOC being being tar- uh, violently targeted. Here she is talking about him on TV. It's getting worse because he has not been held accountable in any way, shape or form. He's not been censured. He's not been expelled. And he's not had his seat forfeited by any of the leadership. And by that, I don't mean to specify Minority Leader Mac- McCarthy and, and McConnell. I do mean Speaker Nancy Pelosi. I do mean um, uh, Senate Leader Chuck Schumer. I do mean Attorney General Merrick Garland. I mean, where are these people? Does he need to act on his psych- like sociopathic fantasy for Representative Ocasio-Cortez? I am very concerned. That's Jennifer Gosar on MSNBC calling out congressional leadership to do something about her crazy brother. And now here she is on CNN the next morning. And I have proximity to this sociopath who has been elected from a very gerrymandered district. There is no other way that someone like Paul wins without that. He is incompetent. It is obvious. I am not speaking in sort of like half nuances here. The dude is obviously incompetent. But I challenge those members to come on the air with me, to call me because they don't. Because you know why? They are very concerned about their offices. They are very concerned about election. And they are not concerned about the American people, of which I am one. Woo-wee! Jennifer Gosar is rip-roaring, mad, wants to see action, and cable news bookers know she is good as a guest. We haven't seen a politician sibling throw him or her under the bus since old Rusty Gingrich let Newt have it back in the early 90s. I'm just kidding. I just made up Rusty. I don't think Newt Gingrich, if he has any siblings, I don't even want to know about it. Okay, what else do we have for you? Oh, this is just in case you're having a good day or you're you're in a good mood or you're you're feeling you know not motivated about getting out, turning out the vote. 
for the midterms. This, this this should wake you up. This is Congressman Jim Jordan fantasizing about taking back the House Republicans and that he gets to be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Here it is. This this will wake you up more than all the coffee you needed today. Or I think we're going to take back the House and Lord willing, I'll get a chance to chair the Judiciary Committee, which is the committee that's supposed to protect your First Amendment liberty, something the Democrats have been attacking for uh, almost a year now. What's didn't the dude allegedly cover up like college students or is it high school being molested by the, the wrestling coach or some shit? I don't know that story. Go go look it up. But that's why he's called Jim Jordan. G.Y.M. Sorry for even mentioning it without really knowing kind of the contours and details of it. But you probably you know about it. Anyway, the idea that he would be the chairman of any congressional committee, much less be representative of a district in Ohio is, is, sh- is shockingly embarrassing and terrifying, but there it is. All right. Now I want to play for you another clip. I saw going around. This is an important one. He's the CEO of Pfizer. His name is Albert Burla. And he said yesterday to the Atlantic council, a Washington DC based think tank that people who spread misinformation on COVID-19 are criminals and have cost millions of lives. There is a very small part of professionals which they circulate on purpose misinformation so that they will mislead those that they have concerned. Those people are criminals. They're not bad people. They're criminals because they literally costed millions of lives. I had to look up that accent. What, what do you think it is? You guess. Oh, wait. He is Greek. If you guess Greek, you win. Okay. Well, a bunch of Democrats, like I think like 10 10 Democrats went over to Glasgow for the climate talks. And one of the first public events scheduled uh, with with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, as well as a a few others that are not as prominent. So I'm not going to mention them. Anyway, AOC went on at this event to talk about the intersections of climate change, indigenous and racial justice and fossil fuel influence. She observed before she ran for Congress while protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016. She also discussed how she sees she now sees these themes reflected in the climate program that Bi- the Biden administration is bringing to the international stage. The headlines were AOC says America's back, but hasn't recovered our moral authority in the world. So kind of a contradicting message. But I love pretty much everything that this woman says and thinks she's a born leader. And so I always play what she's got to say. Here we go. AOC from Glasgow COP26. No. We have not uh, recovered our moral authority. Uh, I believe that we are making steps, but also kind of in reference to the earlier question, we have to actually deliver the action in order to get the respect and authority internationally to get the credit. Uh, We have to draw down emissions to get credit for being committed on climate change. It's really that simple. There you go. AOC answering the question is uh, America recovered its moral authority. I don't think that she put that out there. But then in this clip, this is the one that got a lot of attention. She says uh, we're back. America is back at COP at, and on the international stage as a leader in climate action and drawdown. One thing that I think is so exciting about this time is that When we say that the United States is back, it's not just that we're back in the way that the United States was pursuing climate policy before. It is different. And I would argue that it's a fundamentally different approach. All right. And now that is all of the audio I've got for you. But oh, wait, you know, here's this one more clip. I hate to end on something negative, but I I just want you to know this isn't going away. I'm sorry. This whole argument about CRT is not going away. Here is the evil Senator Rick Scott on CNN with Brianna Keeler, who needs to be able to handle this better. Love Brianna. She does a really good job with these types of interviews. Not sure it should even be happening, frankly, but nonetheless, she does a good job here, but she needs to be even more ready for the bullshit that he's slinging. Parents know it's been, their kids are being indoctrinated with critical race theory in Virginia, and the Democrats wanted to deny it. I mean, and so well, it's the not parents in the curriculum. showed up because they don't like being lied to. I mean, to. Just, just to be clear, it's not, it's not in the curriculum. Um, 
in Virginia. Uh, just, just, oh, just to oh, be Brian, would you like me to here? Let me just read you a few things. Just to, in 2015, while Terry McAuliffe was governor, the Virginia Department of Education promoted incorporating a critical race theory lens in education. You can still find it on the Department of Education's website. Still there. In uh, February 2019, a superintendent not, memo for the Virginia the, Department of Education promoted Senator, critical race theory and not, the idea of white fragility. It's not. It's not I part of the curriculum. Yesterday. It's um, still I, there, I do want to ask you. Just to be clear about Brianna, where you are. Let's, let's all agree. Just, they were trying to indoctrinate kids. Okay, I've heard enough. Tried to indoctrinate kids. That kind of indoctrinate agenda. Force it down their throat. Brainwash. That is the argument as to which they make about what public schools are doing to their kids. We have to find a way, the language, to be able to compete and combat that horse shit, because that is what it is. I mean, to some extent, it's true. It's indoctrinating them into being critical thinkers. And there's so much that we could all criticize about public school curriculum and class sizes and testing. I've made this point over and over. I would love to blow it all up and start from scratch and do things differently for sure. But as long as my kids are in classrooms where the teachers are teaching subjects and there's a conversation and there's a wide variety of points of views and a marketplace of ideas being presented that helps kids learn to critically think. And then you can brainwash your kids on your own time. And we all do that anyway, just simply by being they're watching you. It's every move you make. That's my parenting advice. For those of you that have young kids, the advice I was given, they are always Watching you every move you make, every breath you take, they are watching. Okay, so, anywho, let's move on to the news dump. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see what Pete Coe has cooked up for us today. Rampaging mountain lion parent gives a thump. Her child was safely rescued for today's news dump. Wow! All right, thank you, Pete. This is actually a story from... I asked Pete, I texted him, I was like, is that... Is that a rip from the headlines often the jingles are? And he said, yes, and then sent me a link. It's from the uh, the end of August. Mountain lion killed after attacking child in California. Wildlife authorities say that a mountain lion attacked a five-year-old boy and dragged the child across his front lawn in Southern California has been shot and killed. Still no word on whether or not the boy is going to be scarred by life and not like even the smallest of cats, but we'll check in with him in a few more years. All right, I added that last part. And that is not technically part of the news dump because it didn't happen in the last 24 hours, which is my main criteria. Sometimes I'll report a story happened a couple of days before, but that's usually actually a mistake. So let's take a look at what we've got. And I mentioned a few squeaked in, sneaked in, squeaked in a few headlines at the top, of course. But start with news from U.S. wildlife officials saying political appointees in the President Trump's administration relied on faulty science to justify stripping habitat protections for the imperiled northern spotted owl. Yeah, faulty science used by Trump appointees to cut owl habitat. That's how awful they were. They fucking hate owls. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reversed the decision to, uh, made five days before President Trump left office to drastically shrink so-called critical habitat. For that owl, the small reclusive bird has been in decline for decades as old growth forests were cut in Oregon, Washington, and California. Congratulations to all my friends, the amazing, brave uh, Americans that work at Fish and Wildlife, or as they call it, just fish. USFWS, everybody. Love you guys. Yeah, go ahead. Look up Secretary David Bernhardt. We knew he was going to do that shit when he came in. I did an interview about this dude on the way in at Sirius XM when he came in, and uh, he did just that. I like this story out of Cleveland where a bunch of rich people, or as they call it, a coalition of philanthropies, announced plans Tuesday to launch a nonprofit newsroom that will provide coverage of Cleveland. Kicking off an effort to help fill a void left by the shrinking of news organizations in Ohio. That's pretty great. I really like that idea, and I hope to see more. The American Journalism Project, one of the funders, has launched three other nonprofit news startups and supported 26 others across the country. I'm going to reach out to them and, and interview someone from them. This, this one's called the Ohio Local News Initiative. Well, that's the broader effort 
set to establish a network of nonprofit newsrooms across the state that would share a back office infrastructure with each community having a newsroom to serve local needs. I love this idea. American Journalism Project, I will be calling you. Make a note, Pete. How about this one from the Associated Press in Russia? The uh, Russian authorities have named a prominent LGBT rights group and several lawyers as foreign agents. What does that mean? The Justice Ministry added the Russian LGBT network, prominent lawyer, and four of his former colleagues to its registry of foreign agents. The designation implies additional government scrutiny, carries strong pejorative connotations that can discredit recipients. The LGBT network, of course, has advocated for civil rights in Russia since 2006 and has 17 branches across the country. More cracking down on journalism from an authoritarian regime. Yeah, that's how it works. Oh, how about this sweet story? I'm glad to hear this. Nobel Peace Prize laureate and hero to so many girls around the world, Malala Yousafzai. The Yousafzai? I don't know how to say her last name. Malala is how we always refer to her has announced that she's uh, she's gotten married. She shared photos from her wedding day on Instagram, and I, I just think that's fantastic. Good for her. Old Navy has announced they're going to be bringing back inclusive Santa pajamas with more skin tone colors and patterns. Oh, well, how nice is that? I guess it's as nice as they thought it would make money, probably. But, yeah, last year the retailer debuted its holiday-themed PJs featuring Santas in a range of skin tones. So they got black Santas on the pajamas, and I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely getting them. Is that, is that cultural appropriation? Who's getting me black Santa pajamas? I wear, I'll wear i wear them and model them for the world to see. All right, that is your news, Dom. Thank you very much for joining me in the on the news, hopefully you're caught up, got a lot in there and just under, well, about 26 minutes. But now it's time to get to the next and final part of the program, the interviews, the conversations. If you like the show, please support it with a paid subscription. If you haven't already, go to standupwithpete.com right now and sign up for a paid subscription or just go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic and several, three new people. I think joined today alone, which is awesome. Welcome aboard to all new subscribers. I'm trying to get to 10 by the end of the week. I want 10 new subscribers by the end of the week. Can we do it? Tell your friends, promote the show, let them know how much you get from it, and uh, be a part of our community and grow along with us each and every day. So, all right, and I'll read all your names on the show tomorrow, as well as uh, hopefully meet you on Thursday night at our hangout every Thursday, 8 p.m. East. Host a virtual hangout. Always a great time. I got three guests on today's show. What do you like? What do you like? You like politics? You like my first guest, Michael Cohen. You want to hear me talk with a virologist, a, uh, an expert on infectious diseases while she is at the Magic Kingdom in Disney World with her kids? Yeah, well, uh, you can listen to that one. That one's, that one's number two. That's the second interview after about uh, 20 minutes with Michael Cohen. Uh, or if you really want to hear a thoughtful conversation with a super smart guy who I've known a long time, who has a PhD in clinical psychology and has written a new book, which is a self-help book in, in many ways, and I love it. I really enjoyed talking to my friend Dr. Matt Bellis, who is a writer, a motivational speaker, and a stand-up comedian. And I had a great conversation with Matt. So three different types of conversations for you today. But let's kick it off with the great Michael Cohen. Michael Clo- uh, Michael was a speechwriter at the State Department years ago, early in, in his career. Then he became a, a, col- a writer, a journalist, and a columnist. He was at the Boston Globe for years. And now, like me, he's doing his own independent thing, mostly on Substack. But he also posts audio of his conversations in a podcast like... Forum. You can go to truthandcons.com, truth and consequences, truthandcons.substack.com. I read Michael and everything that he writes. I love following him on Twitter at speechboy71. We've become really good friends over the years as well, and I always love catching up with him. And when I called him yesterday and asked him if I could tape a, a conversation, he just sounded like he wasn't he was he wasn't happy to talk to me. So I, I was busting his balls here at the top, and that's how we started and covered a lot of ground. Here we go. You seem I'm recording, and you seem slightly irritated. No, 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 not at all. 
not in the slightest. <laughs> I've never been happier. I have a, I'm sitting on my couch. I have my, my dog is laid out on top of me. You know, we'll get better than that. Nothing can be. Okay, good. Well, there's a few things. I just wanted to do a midweek check-in with Michael Cohen. You have a lot. You've been saying and, and a lot and writing a lot and thinking a lot. And I have, I keep thinking I want to ask you and start with just getting your take on the elections last week. We've had a little over a week digest them there's a lot to say and think about you've written sure. about this and I, I wanted to get some of your top line feelings especially when it starts with virginia what happened there with the governor i mean i think it's you know it, there's a there's a very boring uh, explanation for what happened last tuesday but it basically comes down to joe biden is not very popular his numbers are pretty bad and it tends to be the case that in off year elections the incumbent party does poorly. And you saw that both in New Jersey and Virginia. In fact, the pattern is pretty similar in New Jersey and Virginia, which suggests that it wasn't so much Terry McCullough for Virginia or Phil Murphy in New Jersey, but just a, a function of a bad political environment and traditional kind of um, uh, backlash against the party that's uh, in power. So I think that's probably the best uh, explanation for what happened. Uh, you know, and I think unless those numbers can be reversed as far as Biden approval rating, I don't like the last thing you said. Do you think that we will see a difference in his approval rating when the supply chain starts to smooth out over the next year and prices go back down a little bit, maybe including gas? Then you see a lot happening with the, you know, your local state infrastructure, maybe. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that can happen in a year. Hard to predict, but you could you could see a lot of change in that year based on what's causing it. COVID. Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly, you know, quite possible and certainly something I think Democrats are holding out hope for that, uh, you know, as the economy improves, as the situation with COVID uh, gets better, more people are vaccinated, more kids are vaccinated, that you're going to see a, a change in the numbers. I mean, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, that buying numbers began to fall in August, uh, you know, as, around the time of the Afghanistan withdrawal, which was which was you know, from the image optic standpoint was pretty bad. And then, you know, September was the worst month we've had of, of COVID deaths and COVID cases since since the vaccines became readily available. So, you know, I don't think it's a huge surprise that you saw this this reversal in political fortunes happen in September. Um, but, you know, October has been a much better month for COVID vaccines as far as cases and hospitalizations and deaths. And, um, you know, certainly uh, vaccinations have have increased the number of vaccinations. And you, you haven't seen that, that sort of broad reversal in in Biden's political fortunes now. Again, it may it may be a lag indicator, it may come in time, um, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's weird. There's something else I think going on here with Biden. I think you could argue that that the Afghanistan kind of punctured into the aura of competence that exists around Biden, the level, the faith you'll have in him, and it may take a little longer, or may not be possible right away to to build back that um, that um, support. Maybe harder uh, to build back better. Maybe it may be hard. It may be hard to build back better. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, it's weird because I keep looking at just you know every day of the stories coming out about you know congressional, public congressional candidates who are you know accused of beating up their wives and their children. I mean, of the subpoenas in January six, and I think this stuff has got to matter. But I don't know how many how much Americans are actually paying attention to it. Yeah. So I don't. Yeah, it's a good, good, good point. Maybe not, not yet. But and you, you just tweeted. But this guy, Sean Parnell, a, a Trump endorsed Pen, uh, Pennsylvania Senate candidate who basically talked about the man's role. A lot of weird stuff between him and so many other commentators and and uh, what's his name? Holly talking about the yeah, lack Josh Holly, Josh Holly, the masculinity stuff. I, I'm I'm fairly surprised that they're playing this card. Right. <laughs> it's I'm not. No, this is this is totally this is totally pro forma, you know. The Dem Republicans say they're the daddy party. They're the party of tough guys and pickup trucks and masculinity. Yeah. I mean, which, of course, is ironic. This is the party that has spent the last five years basically prostrating itself to a narcissistic man child who could give, you know, a rat's ass with any of them. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, I mean, look like Mitch McConnell. And there's a big piece in the Post today about this. Well, he's Connell, not very manly. I mean, well, you know, but again, like he's a guy who basically watched the, the January 6th coverage was outraged by it and then, you know, turns around and basically goes to acquit Trump. I mean, these guys have no, they're, they're cowards, every last one of them, you know, and uh, it's yeah. just, to me to watch Josh Hawley talk about masculinity, I was going to vomit. 
Yeah, no, you're 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 right about them. What is the word prostrating? Prostrating? Prostrating. Or you could say prostituting if you want to. That's fine. I have no <laughs> Well, I mean, you, there's so many. You can think about Jeff Sessions and Lindsey Graham and all and, of these guys. That Ted he Cruz. Has, uh, uh, uh most recently, maybe to some extent, Charlie, uh, rather Chris Christie. Well, Chris Christie, he's like trying to, like dipping his toe in the anti-Trump waters. And of course, he did a couple of days ago when he got, you know, uh, Trump put out the statement criticizing him. So I'm guessing Christie's going to back back off. But I will give Christie credit for one thing. At least he said he's not going to, you know, not run in 2024 if if if, uh, if Trump runs, with pretty much every other Republican saying that if Trump gets in the race, they're just not going to bother running for president, which just shows you what a bunch of cowards and pathetic cowards they are. I mean, I'll at least give Christie pre- uh, credit for, you know, at least saying he won't he won't he won't not run because of that. But um, the rest of these types, I mean, they're just, you know, I mean, these are look, I, masculinity to me is not defined by you know toughness, it's defined by and that's that's sort of like the sort of retrograde notion of what masculinity means, I suppose. But, but, you know, for these guys, it is what it means. And, you know, they're the opposite of that. You know, they're not tough guys at all. One of you the know, definitions they just, that they often refer to, not enough, but I, I, I can see this if we have to, is, is personal responsibility. That seems masculine sure. to me. Seems sure, masculine. That's what, that, well, that's true. I, that should be true for men and women, you know, but sure, you know, yeah, they exactly. don't show any personal responsibility. They, yeah. don't show, they show no responsibility, no accountability. No introspection, no ability to, you know, uh, uh, learn any fucking any lessons at all, practically, right. and certainly not to stand up for what they believe in. You know, these are guys who years ago, I mean, Lindsey Graham said Donald Trump would destroy the Republican Party. He said that five years ago or six years ago or five, whenever it was, you know, and now he basically just, you know, just does whatever Trump asked him to do. I mean, this is a tough guy. This is masculine from the, their standpoint. Give me a break. You have a great piece at your Substack, truthandcons.substack.com, or shorter version is what? I always get it truth wrong. Truth and cons. Truthandcons.com. I love it. I love reading your stuff. I I, there's, I, le- I read a wide perspective of people's takes on things, but I always include yours for several reasons. But this piece is why we're polarized. Punishing GOP members who voted for the infrastructure bill is a surefire way to make American politics even more dysfunctional and polarized than it already is. So, yeah, you had, what, 13 Republicans vote for this bill? 13 House Republicans voted for the infrastructure bill. Um, And as I point out in the piece, what's crazy about that is not that 13 members voted for it. It's that only 13 members voted for it. Because if you go back 10, 20 years, uh, infrastructure bills are the most popular bills uh, in in on Capitol Hill because everybody gets you know, uh, their beak wet, I guess is the way they use a, well, yeah. a folklore expression, but everybody gets something out of it. Well, their constituents uh, get, get major improvements and, exactly. and, 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 and jobs and all kinds of really good stuff for everybody. It's not, I just wanted to clear up beak wet doesn't mean someone's getting paid off. It means their constituents, their states and districts are getting what they're paying exactly. for. <laughs> exactly. They're getting their, their representatives, ones they voted for, are actually looking out for them and for their needs and bringing things back to their districts. I mean, I, you know, the 13 Republicans who voted for this, you know, one of them was Don Young in Alaska. Alaska had a lot of infrastructure needs. He said he voted for it because it's three point, the $3.5 billion for new roadways in Alaska. You know, the congressman from West Virginia, Dave McKinley, said he voted for it because there's more money for rural broadband. And he said, you know, too many of his constituents don't have access to broadband. You know, that's him doing his job. I didn't, I didn't mean to be pejorative when I said this before. I mean, literally, that's him doing his job, looking out for his own constituents, you know, and, and leveraging his vote and his, 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 you know, way one out of 435 to get something that's important to his constituents and other, by the way, other rural communities around the country, you know. And so it is just so what's happening now is these 13 members vote for this and now they're all being. Uh, threatened with losing their committee chairmanships and committee uh, positions because they basically voted for a bill that had, you know, was supported by, by Joe Biden. Forget the fact that 19 senators also voted for it. Um, Republican senators. You know, yeah. Republican senators. Excuse me. Thank you. 19 Republican senators. So, you know, it's just that this kind of stuff is just so toxic because if you're saying to members like you it, it, screw your constituents, screw what's good for you politically, you know, screw what's good for, uh, uh, you know, why people voted for you. But you have to vote the party line and vote Republican. You have to vote with, you know, Kevin McCarthy and the rest of the Republican Party every time. 
I mean, it's just that is not a you can't have an effective Congress like that. Just have, it, what it creates is a parliamentary system with parties vote as one as opposed to voting, you know, right. based on, on right. some, some lesser parochial regional interests. And you can have a parlamentary system if you have a parlamentary system. <laughs> Which we don't have. Right? But you exactly. can't vote this way. And, and most importantly, I think <laughs> this is this is not some bizarre, non-traditional thing for Republicans to support taxpayer money to, to pay for. I mean, the infrastructure is is a thing that was not controversial. And now it is. They're being called traitors by some. You know, I was I was struck by this, you know, uh, Marsha Blackburn, who I follow on Twitter. Just great because, woman, great American. Right. Who makes Tommy Tuberville look like a Mensa graduate. Uh, you know, <laughs> wow. Almost sexist, but I'll allow for it because. No, that's, not, that's not sexist. I, you know, I, I, I one, well. I mean, actually, I mean, in fairness, I think Tommy Tuberville is actually dumber than 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 Marsha Blackburn. But it's a hel- it's a healthy competition. It is. It she's not great. Is. She's very bad. Yeah, go ahead. She's very bad. So she put out this tweet about how, you know, infrastructure bill is part of, you know, Biden's socialist plot, you know, to 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 uh, yeah, destroy, here it is. You, you included to destroy it, America. You included in the piece, Senator Marsha Blackburn, Joe Biden's infrastructure plan. Nothing's more sexist, by the way, than my reading of it. Joe Biden's infrastructure plan is a gateway to socialism and his build back bro government takeover. I mean, can you imagine like the notion that building uh, bridges and highways and waterways and ports is socialism? I mean, Tennessee, you know, the energy comes from Tennessee Valley Authority, a federal program created by FDR during the New Deal. I mean, the chutzpah of these people. I mean, and, they, and they're lying. Of course. I mean, I saw this thing. About, I went to mention Kevin Brady, Congressman Pennsylvania, said, you know, I support ro- money for roads and bridges. I don't support money. I don't support a roads and taxes bill. Well, tell me then, Kevin, how the hell do you pay for those roads? Like, what, 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 kind, of, what kind of childlike notion of government is this? You, you think we should have roads and bridges? Great. Everyone thinks that. But you don't want to fucking pay for it. You don't want anyone to pay for it. And you want to use this as a, as a way to attack Democrats. It's pathetic. Sorry for my my profanity. No, I, I liked apologize. it. It really it really lit no, me it's up. It's just it's just childlike. Yep. And what's what's worse about it is there are so many millions of voters out there who are like, yeah, this is socialism. They just believe the BS that these members of Congress sell to them. You know, and and it's it is just it, the the damage. It's it's so damaging. And the idea that like building things that people need, people that need to get places in America, is socialism. It means basically government. Does should do nothing. That's basically their attitude. It should do nothing. So if you, if you listen to what they're saying, yeah. No, I mean, but, but they, but they take credit for doing something when they've got the power, or or they don't. I mean, you know, one of the hilarious memes going around today is I think that that Midas Touch uh, Twitter account or slash you know uh, progressive video maker. They put out a whole montage of Trump saying it's infrastructure week and other uh, Trump administration people during. And then, you know, the end of it is Biden got it done in one, one got done in one year, what Trump couldn't in four years on the issue of, of infrastructure. And yet they don't want it anymore. They could have passed an infrastructure bill. I guarantee you Democrats would have supported it. I guarantee you they would have supported it. If the Republicans had pushed for infrastructure bill, but you know why they didn't? Why? Because they couldn't agree why? on 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 how to pay for it. I'm sure this is the reason why they couldn't, they wouldn't agree to have to raise taxes to pay for it. And you know there were others who who, who would, they knew that they were members of their, of their caucus who would deride this as as you know wasteful spending. I mean, it's just it's it's this and is where the we fact are. that he couldn't get that done. Infrastructure supposed to be building is supposed to be his thing. It's got to be a, a source of great you know embarrassment and failure. Just never being able to get that done because. Of what you just said, they didn't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay to make America better, and they don't. But they also don't really care. I mean, I've written this many times now. They just don't really care about accomplishing things in Washington. Governing is not of interest to them. The it opposite just yeah, is just not of interest to them. Destroying you know, government and and taking everything they can. <laughs> well, look, but it's a, but I think it's but it's but it's a larger issue, and I'm and I'm not trying to be partisan or, or, or here when I make this comment, but. You know, you look what they in four years in, in, in during the Trump administration, they basically passed a major tax cut. And that that was it. So that's their major accomplishment. I mean, they they tried to repeal Obamacare, which they couldn't do because they couldn't come up with a replacement for it. I mean, I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. If you looked at like 
in the Virginia governor's race, um, you know, Terry McAuliffe had like 20 different issues laid out on his website with, you know, seven to 10 page, you know, documents laying out specifically what he do on agriculture, on taxes, on crime. I, I actually counted Glenn Gunkin had 102 words about what he do for the economy in Virginia. 102 on the website. And when I saw it, I'm like, well, there must be a hyperlink here that I'm missing. Right? There must be more to this. But there wasn't. That's all it was. Because you know what? He didn't care about policy. You know what else? It didn't matter. Because the voters didn't clearly didn't give it, didn't care. So they were more than happy to vote for a guy who had, who's, who had, had literally, who's, by the way, background is working in, you know, Carlock Group, working for finance firm, yeah, yeah. Had, couldn't even say what he would do if elected to help fix the economy in, in Virginia. Uh, you know, beyond a, a bunch of platitudes and a hundred words, you know, it, this is, this is the, and, and like last year, you know, Democrat Republicans didn't bother to do a, a party platform. They just took 2016 platform and they stamped 2020 on it and said, here's our platform. And this is a party that isn't serious about governing. And, you know, there's just no way around it. Hey, I don't know if you saw it or, or not. And granted, we don't quote work together, but we do work together a lot. And uh, I made a video of, of me killing you. <laughs> violently uh mail bomb actually surprisingly um, well you do have a shed don't you yeah <laughs> this is uh i'm trying to get to the story and, and and your reaction to the fact that congressman paul gosar whose own sister his own family hates him his own sister went on i think msnbc and said he's a sociopath he, he came out with this video or he shared a video uh of him killing uh, it's all this animation. I don't think it's him. It's an anime video of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez being stabbed in the back of the neck. They put her face the on the head. video. I'm trying to describe right. it. A lot of people probably have seen it, but if you haven't, go and you don't know what we're talking about. Go watch it to get the context needed for Michael's commentary on on what where where that where that puts us and how he should be censured or punished or anything in in the House Republican Caucus. I don't know if anything's happened as of our taping, but I don't think so. I mean, I want you to consider that that thir- that you have um, people talking about stripping committee uh, ships, committee positions from 13 members who voted for an infrastructure bill. And meanwhile, Paul Gosar, uh, this is not the first time, by the way, he's done something horrible, uh, uh, tweets out a video in which one of his colleagues uh, is murdered. Um, I guarantee he will not lose his job over this. I guarantee you. Right. Uh, and to your point about you mentioned the Sean Parnell earlier, uh, who was he's just strangling in his wife and, and beating his child. He is one of three Republican uh, senatorial candidates who's been accused of uh, abusing women. Herschel Walker was accused of holding a loaded wife to a, gu- a loaded gun to his ex-wife's head. Um, and of course, Eric uh, Greitens in Missouri, who's likely going to yes. be a Republican nominee, who was uh, uh, he uh, what do you call he? He kidnapped and held captive his girlfriend, who then he took pictures of in order to help to try to blackmail her. This is when he was governor of Missouri, which he was forced to resign. But of course, you know, things like that do not harm you in the Republican Party. They actually give you a political boost. And now he's running for Senate, and he'll likely be the nominee of the Republican Party in Missouri. You know, you have Josh Mandel in Ohio basically saying separate church and state is a farce. We don't need it anymore. We should be teaching kids in churches and synagogues rather than public schools. This is who is running for office, Republican Party now. Put aside Mandel, you've got three members of, of, of three, three potential Republican candidates with a, with a history of abusing women. And you've got, obviously, a president who's been accused, accused on two dozen times yep. of assaulting women. Uh, and now you have this Paul Gozar situation. I mean, it is just... Uh, what does that say about the, 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 the morale? I mean, it doesn't... I mean... There is no bottom. There is no bottom. <laughs> I said to you before, I mean, I mean, you and I have had this conversation many times. There is no bottom. There is no excess. There's no, you know, it, it, the only way these guys could really get in trouble is if they ever praised Barack Obama. That would be the way they get in trouble, right? That would be the sin that could be, you couldn't get, you couldn't walk back from. Or in the case of, you know, Adam Kinzinger and, and Anthony Gonzalez, both of whom are not running for election, if you voted to impeach. Right, uh, right. President well, Trump. that's a. Yes, exactly. The only way for them to get in trouble would be for them to vote to impeach Trump. My parents' congressman in central New York, guy named Republican named Mike Katko. He's being John Katko. J- that's what I said. I don't know why you'd correct me. <laughs> John Katko is being, you know, they're trying to primary him up there because he voted for impeachment. He also voted for the infrastructure bill. And you're a traitor. You're a traitor. And 
That's that's how they punish them. But if you if you admit to <laughs> it's not even alleged some of these guys abusing your wife or your girlfriend, like that right raises you up. Uh, if you it's... threaten <laughs> violence against your friends and family, again, that's helpful. It's like Let me a, say something, by the way, just the record, I had a case of the John Catcow when I was in college and I was sick for a week. I'm telling you, it just knocked me out. So you, you did. Wow. It. The John Cat the John Catcow is a very it's really nasty. It really you don't, you don't want to get, get it. And they're working get on the a John vaccine. <laughs> I think they're <laughs> they should be. It's nasty. It's really nasty. Not good. Um but Herschel Walker is accused of pointing a loaded gun at his ex wife's head. Uh that and, can be you know, explained. <laughs> and two weeks ago. You know, uh, Mitch, and by the way, Herschel Walker, I mean, put aside the fact that he appears to be like really mentally unwell, has what business does he have running for the Senate? I mean, has he ever done anything as much in, business as several other people that are in the mean, Senate it, it, that are we don't, we don't discuss the fact that Herschel Walker literally has his only qualification for running for Senate is that he was a running back to the University of Georgia. That's basically it. OK, that's it. And yet he is going to be the public nominee and he could win that race. He could win that race. Did he? Two weeks ago, Mitch McConnell, you know, paragon of, of virtue, paragon of, of morality and ethics. Mitch McConnell, he endorsed Herschel Walker for the Senate uh, race in Georgia. I give up. I give up. Does he have I mean, a chance how, of winning? Yes, of course, there's a chance of winning. I mean, Georgia's a, you know, I mean, I mean, I. Joe Biden narrowly won that race. You know, it's in a in a if Joe Biden's unpopular and there's a wave of election, absolutely Herschel Walker can win. I mean, it seems unimaginable since he is so blatantly unqualified for the job. And, you know, the fact is, you know, Cissy Abrams I assume is going to run for governor, and that should help um turn out for um oh, for, for Ossoff uh, and Warnock. Or, for, well, not Ossoff Warnock. Warnock's Warnock Warnock. on the ticket in yeah. two years. Could should help him. I ma- I imagine he's a slight imagine, advantage. Imagine <laughs> You have Raphael Warnock as your senator, and he's really well liked and well respected and highly intelligent. Or Herschel Walker, <laughs> who once won the Heisman Trophy. He's a great football player. He's a great <laughs> running back. He's great at smashing through walls of people and, and I mean, doing I do find, setups. I do think there is some there is some metaphor here at the fact that you know Herschel Walker to play in the USFL and Donald Trump, of course. You know, so almost single-handedly destroyed the USFL. So I do think <laughs> there's a metaphor here for the well, Republican Party somewhere if we if we look for it. Well, before I before I let you go, I'm kind of and you mentioned football, and I'm kind of obsessed to see you tweeting about it. I'm very obsessed uh, with this Aaron Rodgers thing. I think it matters uh, a lot. I think it's representative of a lot. And I just wanted to get your your hot take. Anything? What's the most important point made or not made? Do you think about this whole? Let me say two things about this. If I okay. may. Yeah. First of all, I'm a Detroit Lions fan, which means my life has been one of generally. Why is that again? Sadness. Yeah. Why? I was, born, I was born in Detroit. I'm a Detroit sports fan. Oh. You know, things worked out well with the Pistons and the Red Wings, but it's been a bit of a, of a clusterfuck with the, yeah, uh, with yeah. the Lions. So anyway, so so I hate the Green Bay Packers pretty much more than I hate any other sports team. So watching Aaron, I have never liked Aaron Rodgers. So watching Aaron Rodgers crash and burn gives me some vicarious pleasure. But can we just like. Just what a selfish jerk this guy is. I mean, and, and my favorite thing about this was him saying, I'm a critical thinker, because really nothing says critical thinking like consulting Joe Rogan about your about the COVID vaccine. I mean, Pete, you know, and you can you can vouch for this, Pete. You know that when I was thinking of the vaccine, I called my favorite podcast host, you, and I said, Pete, should I get the, should I get the vaccine? Not my doctor. I called Pete Dominic that because that's what weird. you do. It was super weird. I didn't know. I didn't know what to to tell you. I was like, I, why are I? I think I think I said, why are you asking me? You're such a smart guy. I'm a critical thinker. I'm a critical thinker. But the favorite thing is that Mr. Critical Thinker, who basically spends this entire interview uh, on Friday, basically doing Mad Libs anti vaxxer right? I mean, just basically (laughs) one. It's so good. One anti vaxxer platitude after another. Yes. None of which add up or make any any sense at all. And, you know, he's a critical thinker. I mean, he's a schmuck. Well, I he need, is. He's a schmuck. I need, uh, I need help to punch up uh, uh, this one. He used the trifecta of woke mob, cancel culture, and, and witch hunt. 
the trifecta of what you should use that in a piece. But <laughs> the, what are the, when those three are worked in and critical thinker should be an added bonus. But and critical thinker. Right. And I'm not an anti-vaxxer, though. As again, I play I play anti-vax mad lips here. I mean, honestly, it's just it's a clown show, you know, and, and the thing I'll say with this, and this is one positive. I think I said this to you on Twitter is at least, you know, at least we can still live in a society in which being a selfish jerk, there is some public price we pay for that. Right. And I don't think he ever lives this one down. I think he will ever, forever be defined by this uh, decision. He had not to get vaccinated and forever defined by that ridiculous interview that he gave. I think it sticks with him for a long time. And I think also, you know, one last thing is too, I think it's, it's worth noting 80% of Americans have had at least one vaccine shot. 70% are fully vaccinated. Mm. You know, Aaron Rodgers is the minority in this country, thank, thankfully. You know, it, people are getting vaccinated and they're not listening to schmuckles like Aaron Rodgers. I just love calling Aaron Rodgers a schmuck, by the way. It makes me happy. Uh, no, but literally no one's listening to this guy. And I think it's good. And, and I think the criticism he's getting is because people recognize that this is just absurd. And we should get people to get vaccinated. And so I do think it says something about sort of the, the diminishing, I guess, popularity, for lack of a better word, of being an anti-vaxxer. I think at one point there's some, there's some, there's some, I don't know, weird political benefit or, or a cultural benefit from it. I think it's fading pretty quickly as people recognize that you need to get vaccinated and people are getting vaccinated. One of the um, things that's irks me the most about this is somebody else came out today. And, uh, oh, is uh, Emilio Estevez. It's, I'm not getting vaccinated but I'm not an anti-vaxxer. It's this idea of trying to have it both ways. They know, they're smart enough to know how terrible it is to be against the scientific consensus where there's so much anecdotal proof at this point of people. And and, and so they, they don't want to be known as an and I'm against this vaccine, but but I'm not an anti-vaxxer. What, what is, that would be like saying... <laughs> I don't even understand how you make that kind of argument. Although I think the proper response you mentioned, Emilio Estevez, is to say, who? Well, yeah, that's hurtful. He's he's had he's a, a few. Long, I mean, I I, I guess I guess maybe we hiccups. should listen to the guy who started the Mighty Ducks about well, vaccines. I guess maybe we should. I'm waiting know. to hear what his better half, Charlie Sheen, thinks about the vaccine. I haven't heard. <laughs> I, I mean, a guy him. who's put pretty much everything you could possibly put into your body in his body. It would be ironic if he was an anti vaccine You know, we must have Martin Sheen. I've been thinking about this. We must have in a, uh, him on a, on a pedestal he doesn't deserve. There's just no way that that but that these two sons of his could both be. <laughs> It may be, maybe I'm being too hard on Emilio. Uh, maybe. I mean, let's face it. Of the two of them, Charlie Sheen's definitely the fuck up. I mean, I think we can agree on that. Yeah, I think we can. <laughs> okay, buddy. Well, I appreciate you checking in with me here midweek. And uh, I didn't even get to all of your, your latest, uh, but everybody should go check it out and subscribe to Michael and uh, get all the hey, great Can bonus. I ask you one question, Pete? When, when does the podcast go from just sort of being news and information entertainment to being just sort of pro shed all the time? When does that, are you making that transition? I would, I mean, listen, if I could talk about the shed and the way that it's transformed my life and in, 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 in a way that I think people would care about, it's all I'd do. <laughs> I've tried to, I've tried to proselytize, like I've really gotten out there and talked about it a lot, but it's 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 almost embarrassing because I realize people give me an opening like you just did, and then at some point they're like, "I gotta go, I have to go." Listen, honestly, your metamorphosis into Ted Kaczynski is one of the most fascinating evolutions in modern media. I mean, I'm just fascinated by it. It's it's it, it blows me away. It's just really. wild that that someone whose address I have keeps making those jokes. <laughs> Sleep with one eye open, Michael Cohen. I listen. I, I have a doorman, so I'm just letting it. Let, let, said that oh, you know. we we know all about him. <laughs> yes, <laughs> tell Derek we said hello. <laughs> all right, Pete. I'm going to uh, sleep with one eye open tonight. Good luck. Thank you very much. Good yeah, luck. Thank today. you, sir. <laughs> all right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. See, he was like tired. He didn't want to talk to me when I first come. He was probably like, "Yeah, no, I will. Fine, I'll get it up and." Get the dog and we'll do a little top. But by the end, I had him. We were, he liked it. He enjoyed it. I always love talking to Michael. Go follow him at Speech Boy 71. Never gets old. Tell him and anybody who joins me on a regular basis how much you appreciate them uh, on the program, their, their perspective. And Michael, great on Twitter. Follow him there. But also go subscribe right now to his work. If you're not getting his email, then you should go pay for it. It's truthandcons.substack.com. 
and uh, Michael's raising two daughters and awesome guy, good friend of mine. Love getting his perspective. And he's got a lot of offerings on his Substack as well. So check it out. All right. Next, it's Dr. Megan May. Dr. Megan May, of course, is a microbiologist. She's an expert on infectious disease, and she knows all about pandemics and how they spread. Of course, she reached out to me in January of 2020 and said, um, Pete, you might want to talk to me about this. I've been listening to your show for a long time. We should probably talk. I think we should talk. And I called her off the air and we talked and I was like, yeah, we should tape a conversation. And she warned us and we all have her to thank. And she's been just so great to talk to over the past couple of years, getting to know her and getting to know her work and the way that she delivers it. And she's just obviously so likable and fun that she was and she loves doing the show, obviously. And she was at, she's at Disney World with her family and her dad and I think her in-laws and her kids. And and so I was like, well, I don't know. Should we talk? And she's like, it's fine. My kids, when they get on Magic Mountain, I'll text you. And that's what she, we talked. And it was awesome. And she was at the Magic Kingdom the entire time. I called Dr. Megan May, who is on Twitter. You got to follow her on Twitter and let her know that you enjoyed this. And thank you for joining Pete on your vacation. DR May 5. She will be thrilled to hear from you. DR May 5 on Twitter. And let's get to uh, our conversation from Magic Mountain. She really wanted to unload on Aaron Rodgers, and it was awesome. So let's give Dr. Megan May a call at the Magic Kingdom live from Disney. Hello? Dr. Megan May. How are you? You're at the Magic Kingdom as we speak. I sure am. I am in Tomorrowland. I am in front of the Carousel of Progress waiting for my husband and son to finish going on Space Mountain because I am too chicken to go on it. All right. Well, promise me because every every listening will be like, I can't (laughs) believe that you made her talk to you. While she was at the Magic Kingdom with your family. So promise me that you're only going to talk to me for a few minutes and then you're going to go be with your family. I absolutely am because you and Space Mountain are standing between me and tacos. So it'll just be a few <laughs> minutes. And I have to also point out that this was this was me. I pinged you and said, I have feelings about Aaron Rodgers that okay. are not good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have good feelings about Aaron Rodgers? I had neutral at best feelings about Aaron Rodgers, and now I have bad ones. Okay, so without me asking, well, I do have one specific question. And then you can just rant. Sounds good. Okay, the the claim of having an allergy to the mRNAs, so those are just off the table. What do you... You don't know his medical history. You don't know mine. If I I said I had allergies and I couldn't take them, what would you say? So there are three specific things I would say, not being your physician and not knowing your medical history. The first is that I understand there's a well-known complication for people having a slightly above background rate of experiencing anaphylactic shock. So that's the kind of throat closing allergic type reaction uh, where you have to use an EpiPen. So that, that reaction is exactly why we have people wait 15 minutes after they get their shot before they can leave. Because if they're going to have that reaction, it will be immediate. And there'll be people on hand who can administer an EpiPen to you. So If you're worried about having that, which, you know, you wouldn't predict ahead of time, that's an issue that, you know, the immunization protocol has really accounted for. Um, Oh, there's an announcement from the people mover. Delightful. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. No, Um, but if you keep (laughs) dropping in Disney things, that will be fun. So please don't stop. Go ahead. Sounds good. Um, Well, you know, I'm easily distracted, so there's a high probability that will be happening, even if you ask me not to. So that's number one, is this potential for anaphylaxis that people have been hearing about. The second thing is that there's one ingredient in the uh, mRNA vaccine, so that's Pfizer and Moderna, uh, called polyethylene glycol, or PEG, and this is the ingredient that's thought to create the anaphylactic shock reactions. And 
there is a body of literature, which is pretty small, but, you know, it is there that suggests some people can actually develop true allergies to PEG. It's really hard to diagnose that in any meaningful way because it's in so many products that people use. Um, it's in, it's the key ingredient in Miralax. It's in toothpaste. It's in bubble bath. It's in body lotion. It's in all kinds of stuff. So while I cannot say for certain he does not truly have this allergy and has not officially been diagnosed with it, if he, for starters, that feels somewhat unlikely, but if he had truly been diagnosed with that allergy to PEG, a medical exemption from taking either of those vaccines, which he could have just said, and there would have been zero reason to lie about it. So that being said, again, the, that leads us to the third point, which is if he truly could not take the mRNA vaccines, he could still take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And, okay, there's some kind of, like, faux snow happening right now. It's all decorated for the holidays. <laughs> and <laughs> as a person who lives in Maine, this is very disorienting to see, like, <laughs> faux snow and palm trees. Anyway, sorry, distracted again. Um, the Johnson & Johnson. He, he if could he... very easily have taken the Johnson & Johnson vaccine which he did address in his interview with Pat McAfee. But that being said, his way of addressing it was you know, laughable on his face because for starters, as, as he referred to, the availability of the J&J vaccine was paused for a few weeks while they evaluated claims about blood clots. And for the overwhelming majority of people, it seemed that there, it turned out there was no additional risk. For the, the, the group that did have a slightly elevated risk were younger women, which would not seem to apply to Aaron Rodgers that I am aware of. So it, it, that was sort of a stupid rationale. They're just saying, you know, that, well, I can't possibly have taken this vaccine because it was, you know, frozen and it had this high risk of blood clots for me. It didn't. So all of those all of those reasons just fell absolutely flat. And the um, the the piece that I just really cannot get past is if he truly had an allergy, as he claims to the ingredient that he would have had an absolutely bona fide, valid reason to not take them. And the people that he is referring to as the woke mob, you know, self-included, of course, um, would have very readily said, oh, he can't take this vaccine. It's not safe for him. Therefore, it's so important that everybody around him take it to keep him safe, which is the opposite of, you know, I, I know I believe he also muttered something about witch hunts and cancel culture, but right. that would be the opposite of what the reaction actually would have been for a person, again, who has a true bona fide medical exemption. Um, it was really frustrating. So that's that's the answer to your question. And then I have a bonus side rant. Okay, let's and go. Uh, let's go to the bonus <laughs> side rant. And it is brought to you by the Sunshine Season Food Fair at Epcot Center, where I did my college internship. Excellent. That must have been such a fun internship. It really that's was. tomorrow. It really that's was. That's tomorrow, by the way. Okay. Nice. I can't <laughs> send me pictures. I absolutely will. And it's wine and food festival and the adults who are not grandparents get to go back tomorrow night. Sans children. So that'll yeah. be delightful. Anyway. Oh, the part we didn't mention is that I'm here with my husband, our children and all of the in-laws from the husband side of things. So it's actually been a delightful experience. Anyway, I love bonus it. rant round. Bonus rant um, round. Bonus side rant, I apologize. Bonus side rant. Forgot the side. <laughs> the bonus side rant comes from Aaron Rodgers' absolute weasel wording on the word immunization, which I just saw Terry Bradshaw apparently also took him to task for. And here's where the, the weasel wording comes in. When he said, I am immunized, 
if he is correctly describing the regimen of treatments that he and Joe Rogan cooked up for himself. Um, <laughs> that's who I get all of my best advice yeah, from, sure. by the way. <laughs> um, so it, he is technically not incorrect when he says he was immunized. If he has been taking infusions of monoclonal antibodies, that procedurally is called a passive immunization. So Quick little backstory science lesson. We have this terrible habit in medicine of using the term immunization and the term vaccination interchangeably. They're not strictly speaking the exact same thing. They're in, there's a Venn diagram with a lot of crossover, but they're not exactly the same thing. So a vaccination is where you get injected with something and your own body makes its own long-lasting immunity to it. Immunization is just the creation of immunity. So in that way, so this is one of those all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares things. So all vaccinations are by definition immunizations, but not all immunizations are vaccinations. Because okay, but you can... But the you can import- transfer antibodies to somebody, and technically you are creating immunity in that person, but they are not being vaccinated. Um, the, the, best, the, the best and most widespread example of that would be um, breastfeeding women transferring antibodies to newborn babies. So those, those babies will get a little bit of protection from their mom's antibodies until they can create their own immunity, but it's not a permanent thing. It doesn't last long. Uh, and the other example that we know of other than COVID um, monoclonal antibody therapies would be if somebody gets bitten by a bat, you give them rabies and a serum. That Those are what's called passive immunizations. They don't give you permanent immunity, but they do give you temporary immunity. Is it- so when he said he was immunized, he technically wasn't wrong, but it was incredibly misleading. But well, hold on a second. I think he might have been. Well, first of all, I thought it was really bizarre that Joe Rogan suggested and Aaron Rodgers took the advice to actually buy a bat and let it bite him. But nobody's talking about that. Moving on. Uh, (laughs) He wanted to be passively immunized. You had me for half a second. I was like, really? That happened? (laughs) Yeah, they're that rich. So the but but the monoclonal monoclonal antibodies were mm-hmm. only given to him and are only prescribed to people who contract COVID, right? Correct. But so, it's my understanding that he was receiving them beforehand for a period of months, thinking that that would create permanent immunity. Is that? But there's a whole lot of smoke around this whole story. And that, so it's very clear that he started taking them again after being diagnosed on the advice of Joe Rogan, I don't know who and how Joe Rogan got him a prescription for them, but it's my understanding that that was part of his pre his you know months long preparation where he did those infusions well, why would and then you, a bunch of but, homeopathic jazz. Well, oh God, don't get me started. What's the difference between the <laughs> the monoclonal antibodies and the vaccine? My understanding is it's basically the same thing. It, it, they're related, but they're not exactly the same. So monoclonal antibodies are you literally, so antibodies are the proteins that are made by the immune system that are going to soak up the virus should it enter your body. When you are vaccinated, you make your own and you create this memory response where you can continue cranking those antibodies out um, until you are exposed to COVID, until you are boosted enough to have lifelong immunity um, or uh, I don't know why I said, or that's, those are pretty much the only two options. Um, And so you will have a kind of continual renewable source of those antibodies. If I were sitting on this bench and the carousel of progress included a free infusion of monoclonal antibodies to COVID, they would go into my arm. They would float around for, you know, some period of time that is not much longer than 24 to 48 hours, and then they would be gone. And it would be as though I never received them. And so all the people who, um, that's why a lot of us on 
Twitter were, you know, kind of doing the throw my hands in the air bit, because if all of the people that were stating these monoclonal antibodies work so great, well, I can just get those if I have COVID, what's the problem? Why are, you know, why would this not be preferable? And it's sort of like, okay, but, or you could get the vaccine and make your own and not have to be hospitalized, take up a hospital bed or take up a triage bed, use IV supplies and, you know, potentially take doses away from other people who maybe couldn't get vaccinated and now need these to get better. Um, So it's a difference, but in both cases, you have COVID being attacked by antibodies, but in the case of being vaccinated, you've made your own and you have a renewable source for the foreseeable future. Whereas if you're infused with monoclonals, you only have them very temporarily. Okay. So I got it. One more question, which is a question about the long-term side effects or effects of vaccines. My understanding is that vaccines don't work that way. There aren't long term side effects or effects that anybody needs to be worried about uh, for any vaccines, including this vaccine. And then when someone says we don't know because it's a new vaccine, actually, we do because it's it's been tested. Like help us help people understand the concerns or lack of concerns about long term effects and whether or not I'm going to be uh, made sterile, and now that would be hard for me because I had a vas- I, I had a vasectomy, so that's You'd not. You'd be ultra sterile. You'd I'd be, like be super, super sterile. sterile. But the 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 <laughs> and then the other joke kind of is like if you're worried about long term anything, maybe playing professional football is not the or best. Or risking COVID, wherein the NAGM uh, NEJM just published a big giant analysis a couple weeks ago showing that. Fifty-three percent of all COVID survivors have at least one long-term symptom for over six months. So, like, yeah, that's a permanent thing. In addition to the whole professional football bit, um, yeah, no, it, it's it's an argument that I just it continues to baffle me that people are nervous about a hypothetical theoretical thing that there is really zero reason to suspect would happen, as opposed to an actual risk that we no, has a very high probability of giving you long-term effects. Anywho, um, the, the, the thing with vaccines is it's, so I'm going to do the, the thing that science communicators really shouldn't ever do, which is to speak exactly like a scientist. And that is, it, it's impossible to say that there is 0% chance that any bad side effects will happen. However, the bad side effects that have been seen from previously known vaccines are, first of all, unbelievably rare in, in the you know one per multiple millions range. And when there is a, a permanent bad side effect, almost exclusively you have this happen in a patient who has pretty significant underlying underlying issues, um, whether they're, you know, hyperimmune autoimmune type issues or um, neurologic issues that are exacerbated by inflammation. So the um, the issue being that if you have a, a person who has neurological issues that are going to be really, really magnified by severe inflammation, and that happens to happen after they're vaccinated, it, it, they were going to be exacerbated anyway. All that person had to do was catch strep throat and get a high fever and it would have been exacerbated. So it's not, I, I, I'm hesitant to say it's impossible that these things would ever happen because we do know of, of certain cases where they have, but it's just important to keep in mind the billions of people on planet Earth who have been vaccinated with numerous preparations and are not only perfectly fine, but are healthier and safer for it. And it's just maddening to me when, especially with COVID, we know there's this very high probability of these permanent, of permanent impacts yeah. and permanent outright yeah. disabilities. 
that are going to come with this, not to mention all the medical bills, not to mention people who can no longer do their previous profession looking at you, police officers and firefighters. Right, um, right, right. It's, 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 which is just tragic uh, when you have a person who can physically no longer do a job that they absolutely loved because they didn't get vaccinated. Anyway, but as to your sterility or super sterility, um, hmm. as, as discussed, the, yeah, that was a weird segue. Sorry about that. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. You look at me. I made it awkward. Sorry. Um, but the, the, the issue with infertility and vaccines, I, this is just a perennial favorite. Um, before people said it about the COVID vaccine, they said it about the HPV vaccine. And before mm. they said it about the HPV vaccine, they said it about the hepatitis vaccine. It's, it's a thing that always comes back because fear of infertility in younger people is always a big hit. You know, it's a, it's a really good alarmist thing to say. Um, the backstory with the COVID vaccine was that you, um, the original rationale for why this would, I'm doing air quotes, although you can't see me, but I'm sitting on a bench by myself and I'm looking like a moron doing air quotes. But anyways, the, um, <laughs> the, the air quotes backstory for this, for the COVID vaccine was that a, a couple of people had, had been talking about the idea of the part, the spike protein that the mRNA vaccines encode that your body makes and you make an immune response to. People are screaming on the people mover. I didn't think it was that exciting a ride, but good for them. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, the spike protein uh, was described to have some kind of shape, structural and, and shape similarity to a protein that is part of the placenta during pregnancy. And so if that happens and you make a, a big, giant, flashy immune response to that protein, the thought was, could those antibodies then attack the placenta in pregnant women and cause either outright miscarriage or stillbirth or some other adverse pregnancy outcome. So that was kind of the faux backstory on the infertility thing. And then uh, as happens when you're dealing with, with um, anti-vaccine stuff, somebody goes ahead and does the experiment, right, where they take antibodies from vaccinated people and they take that placental protein and show they don't really interact with each other and that's not something that you have to worry about. And then they go into the, you know, the clinical trial data and uh, show that, you know, multiple women got pregnant during the clinical trials. And there, I believe in the Pfizer trial, there were 23 women who became pregnant, only one miscarried. And she was in the placebo group. So mm. you look and you say, look, this is really not a thing that happens. Um, so then it just became a, a general, uh, I think it just causes infertility in women. And then wow. that that was only scary for women, and we had to be widespread scary. So then it became it causes infertility, no further specification given. So then Aaron Rodgers and Joe Rogan come along, and this is clear since it again, I'm doing air quotes pacing in front of a bench now, um, because it causes infertility, the thought is and and we have no specification if this is male or female. And, you know, which is any of your listeners who are fertility specialists may be, you know, face palming super hard because the, many of the things that cause infertility in men are very different than the things that cause infertility in women. And so it, it, it's really hard for one blanket thing to cause infertility unless you're talking about like Chernobyl tours or something like that. Because, um, you know, that'll do it. But it, it, yeah, so it's a... It was a very frustrating thing, and I, I just hope that nobody is listening to this fool and that his, yeah, he thinks long and harm about, hard about right. the yeah. wins and money's costs to the team. So there you go. All right. Anything else about Aaron Rodgers I've, or anything else? Uh, not him. I've just been rejoined by my 
by my husband and son who have come off of Space Mountain All and right, look like they had a fun time. Tell them um, we'd like a reaction to the ride. Uh, uh, tell them you're on the podcast. Could you, could they just give us a review <laughs> of, of their second trip on Space Mountain? Do either of you have a review of the ride you'd like to share? I really liked it. It was cool. It was fast. There were sun drops with me. Awesome. Awesome. Twelve-year-old really liked it. There were it was cool. It was fast. There were sudden drops, and it was amazing. How? Who? Go, uh, last question. <laughs> last question for you and your family. Who goes to sure. Disney Disney World or even on vacation the first uh, week of uh, of November? What What is this week? Your kids are in school. I, uh, what? Why? Why are you there now? <laughs> it's off peak. Um. Because I'm a suboptimal parent. Uh, no, there was a <laughs> there's a holiday in the middle of the week, and so it's one oh, you know right, right. one less missed day. And okay, yeah. well you're, we you guys are awesome parents. Have a great time. <laughs> Thank you for taking a break from Disney to educate us. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you as always. Bye bye. Thanks, Megan. Bye. Have a good day. You too. Now, wasn't that fun to talk to a expert in infectious disease while she's at the Magic Kingdom with her family? Love it. Love her. DR May 5 on Twitter. Definitely go let her know that you heard her here and you appreciated her joining us to to weigh in on all things Aaron Rodgers and COVID and more. All right. So my final guest on today's show is an old friend of mine. We go way back in the comedy world and he was always better than all the rest of us because he actually was an educated thoughtful guy he has a phd in clinical psychology with a sub specialty in clinical neuropsychology he's been a professional speaker and stand-up comedian for over two decades reaching over a hundred thousand youth and adults a year and most importantly He's a passionate advocate for mental health who uses humor and lots of audience interaction to deliver his message. You can find out more about Matt at mattbellis.com, at Matt Bellis on social media. And his new book is titled Life is Disappointing and Other Inspiring Thoughts. And we talked about it in our lives together. And I want to share that with you right now because I think and hope that you'll take a lot away from this and maybe get Matt's book. Here we go. For the first time on the Stand Up with Pete Dominic podcast, Matt Bellis. First of all, I've just talked about you and, and how I know you, but how, how do you how do we know each other, Matt? So a mutual friend is actually a cousin of mine, Joe Matarese, uh, a comedian extraordinaire. They remember him from such big hits as America's Got Talent, yeah. right? Yeah, he was on Howard Letterman. Stern for that, yeah. Yeah. Letterman, yeah, we could do his whole, let's give him all his credits. And the comedy cabaret circuit from uh, the late <laughs> <laughs> 2000s. It was where I started. See, I, I didn't know Joe, you know, growing up. He's my third cousin, but we connected when I started doing stand-up. And you're one of the first people he introduced me to. I was so appreciative that Joe brought me into that world. Because as you know, in comedy, like if you don't have an in, like a person yeah. uh, who's kind of vouching for you, it's, it's even harder, right? And so Joe brought me in. I got to meet really the good people, I think, in the business. And you were the first one. And uh, you always made me laugh. I love how present you are on stage. And I, that was one of the notes I, I remember thinking like, man, you have to be in the moment. You can't just be thinking about your bits because the funniest stuff is going to happen is like when you're present mentally. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I believe. I mean, uh, but maybe that's because I'm not a prolific writer. But there, you know, just humor is is a thing that we all can relate to. And when it happened right now, when we all saw it in this moment, it's funnier than anything that you kind of had 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 pre written. I guess is what you're saying. Absolutely, yeah. and I see that most with the. I work a lot with with teenagers doing large group assemblies, and they can sniff out prepared bits you yeah. gotta actually sneak them in right you gotta like sh- surprise them but it's the in the moment stuff that they love like they reward you for that you wrote a book you're a motivational speaker and you wrote a book called uh, life is disappointing and other inspiring thoughts why do i uh even want to open this book it sounds depressing i thought i'm supposed to be inspired <laughs> Yeah, it's an odd career move for a guy who's trying to 
motivate people. I, it was funny that this idea was, was sort of gnawing at me about three years ago and it just wasn't going away. You know, this idea that like, gosh, no matter what we do, there's always like disappointment lurking. Someone said to me like disappointment, they're like weeds. They're just waiting to root somewhere. <laughs> and it seemed like no matter how much success you had, no matter how much you worked on yourself, like there was always something around the corner. And I wanted to write about that fact because I think disappointment can be incredibly inspiring. And the fact that life is disappointing when it works out for you, that's when you really should show gratitude, right? That's when you should really feel good. Like, oh my gosh, I just had a great interview with Pete Dominic on his podcast. I'm flying high. But many people, maybe they don't, they're not as grateful as they should be um, when life works out. And so these are the thoughts in my head and I wanted to write it and I start writing and then the most amazing thing happened to me. There were three major life disappointments that just bam, one after another just hit me. The first one being the pandemic you know, wiping out my business for two months. And I used to brag to my wife, like for me to lose my business, I have to close every school in the country. <laughs> March 12th, 2020. Oh my God. Right. And she said, remember what you said? Yes, yeah, so I do. That was the first one. So here I am writing a book about the thing I'm now living through. And then there were two more that came and hit me too. So it's just been an amazing. You write about your own. I, 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 I try to act like I haven't been reading the book, but I have been, and I'm really enjoying it. I love these types of books, and I've always loved your work and your mind and your positivity and your thoughtfulness. You've you've always been someone who I admire a lot, and and knew that and know that. And when I'm spending time with you and I'm talking to you, it's going to be time well spent. I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy it and probably learn something from you. And so you you talk about your own personal disappointments and adversity and how to how to turn it around, how to look at it, how to gain perspective. And I I so appreciated it. There's a lot of, I think, original points and cer certainly relevant points. What are you trying to do? Like, who's the target audience for this book? So when I wrote it, I just thought, well, anyone who's been through some stuff. So it could certainly be a high school kid who's I met one yesterday who lost both his parents who totally got this conversation. Right. I mean, he's young. He's not he's on the young side for the book, but he's been through some things and he's experienced this and he appreciated it. I saw it as a book for mainly people in their adult, early adult years who have uh, who have struggled at times to find their path and are just starting to realize like, oh, wow, I thought I was always told that you did this, this and this and then you're happy. And it doesn't seem to be that way. So that, that's who I was thinking about. Um, those, you know, 20 somethings, but it can be for anyone really. Yeah. I mean, everybody's had uh, plenty of disappointment, I suppose. I mean, it's all your perspective and, and how you deal with it. But, but I do think that it's easy to look at like your life on a spectrum and, and, and think about how, where the setbacks have been and where the disappointments, where the tragedies, those crucible moments and try to see where, if anything, you learn from them, but it, like, I just feel like you are, you're talking a lot about the, as my wife says, the, well, I, I guess she's quoting somebody else, but the, the Lotus grows out of the mud is what she told me after I lost my gig. And that's you're, you're, you're saying that in so many different ways in this book that through some of the most difficult adversity and you cite so many young people that you've talked to, you just mentioned one uh, amazing things can happen it, even in Newtown, where you spoke at the Sandy Hook shooting, you talked to a student there who wouldn't. I mean, talk, talk about that one. I mean, that, that seems to be the most extreme one. Like you're a child, you're in your classroom and you see your friends murdered, or at least if you didn't see it, it happened in your school. What does that possibly do to the rest of your life? Much less anybody who was in that community, much less our whole country. Right. My daughters worry about it because of that. Yeah, so that that gig was was interesting because that school is a, what they call a quiet school. They don't allow the doors to slam. This is Newtown High School. And I just spoke to the ninth graders, about a third of which had lived through Sandy Hook. And uh, you can tell that the kids are a, a very affected. You know, as I was speaking, I didn't realize how many references I made to people sick or dying. And I'm like, oh gosh, I wasn't like trying to come here to upset people. But there were some students who were affected you know, emotionally. Um, after well, the first presentation, a young man came up to me and who you're referencing. And he was talking to me like, like you would expect a 35 year old to talk. Like he was so mature. He clearly processed a lot of things. He'd been in therapy. He'd, 
he'd seen life on a different level. And, and he's a high school kid, a young high school kid at that. And that wasn't the first time I'd seen that level of maturity from someone uh, who'd been through trauma. So it, it gets the wheels turning of like, huh, you know, what is, what is this process do? Now, there's been some great work done on post-traumatic growth that many people experience after trauma. Not everybody goes to the post-traumatic stress disorder spectrum. Some people over time, you know, get growth out of this. And this kid clearly had, and he was more mature for it. And we had this great conversation. It was like one of the things where you just want to tear up because you realize, geez, this kid's seen horrible things and he's like dealing with it with this strength that is admirable. I feel like one of the most powerful phrases or ideas for a young person, much less the rest of us, is that you're not alone. Whatever you're going through, this horrible experience, tragic loss, whatever it is, somebody's been through it. Somebody's going through it right now. And yet life is, there's a lot of suffering. You, you write about the, you know, the Buddhist teaching that, that life is suffering and, and you take that on. But the question I think you're getting at is, is how do you deal with the pain, the disappointment, the, the failure, the suffering? Cause it's all not the same. And there's a lot of different ways to describe it. You're not saying that everybody can turn their life around that everybody can turn tragedy into success. Cause I think if you were saying that it would, it would feel, and it does feel for a lot of people who can't seem to get out of the suck, like a judgment and well, I must just be doing something wrong. That's not what you're saying, right? Absolutely. You know, I, I have a whole chapter on when disappointment basically turns into depression. And we know for people who are experiencing those things that they don't have to have a reason to be depressed. Depression is overwhelming. I'm a psychologist, so I, I've treated patients uh, who've been depressed, and um, it is a different type of struggle than what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about an event like you with Sirius that I remember when, when Joe actually told me about it initially, just feeling myself like in my chest. I had this feeling of, oh, God, I'm going to just really feel for Pete because <laughs> I, I can imagine what that must be like. Um, and then to see the outcome, like to see your post-traumatic growth from this, right? The inspiration and looking, I get to look at it now, the shed and the show and everything. And you think to yourself, this is a guy who processed the pain of it. He, he felt it full on, but then was able to move, right? To take that and propel himself forward. If you're truly depressed, you know, whether you go through a trauma or not, that's you not being able to act. Like it's inaction. You're feeling depressed. You can't get out of it. And so many people experience that. And I have nothing but compassion for them and love, and, and I hope they can, we can get treatment to help them get moving. Um, in your case, though, Pete, it was exactly, you're in the zone of the people I was thinking about when I wrote this book. Wow. Like, you, you feel that pain, it's overwhelming, it's like a wave, and I read a lot about surfing, like, you get slammed to the ground, and you're just like, oh my God, am I alive? Like, you get up, you're like, I think I, think I am, I'm still here. And now what? And now this energy comes out of you shortly thereafter, weeks, months later, and it's like, what am I gonna do with this pain? And if you find something that's, that feels good, in your case, it was creating this, this show and this shed and it was like a symbol of your, your struggle, suddenly it has meaning now. You've given meaning to that horrible thing. You've, uh, you've overcome it, but now you're actually and potentially going to be more successful, I think, as a result. I look at you now and I think, well, this guy's got control over his schedule, Yeah. right? He doesn't have people barking down his neck probably to like, you got to get up at this time and be in the building now or else, you know, you don't have that, right? So you... You're more your your own boss. I imagine. I'm just. I'm yeah. No, that's here, but. no. Your 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 assumptions are are. I mean, I think most people's assumptions about you know leaving a corporate gig and 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 being self employed. They're probably mostly pretty accurate of me. But like I, I think of like my. You're using me for it as an example. We can use you. You can use anybody for an example. I I kind of think and try to be sensitive with like the. Di I call it circumstantial, Matt. Like there are the circumstances of your life that change, and then you react any infinite ways to those circumstances, good, bad, and different. You take action, you don't, you sit there, you mull it, you, whatever it is, that's different than a, the kind of depression that you're also talking about in an expert at, at dealing with and, and, and treating. So what, what's the difference there? Again, you kind of just split those hairs, but like circumstantial situation, lost my job, divorce, you know, um, my, my dog died, something, my kid is sick. I am sick. COVID I'm worried, whatever it is, the circumstances 
versus the kind of brain chemistry or genetics or longer term inability to handle. I don't know. What am I saying? Yeah. It, the inability to function, you know, in psychological, you know, uh, conversations, it's always like, does this impair your function? Whether it's addiction, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, addiction, when yeah. it starts to erode your ability to get up in the morning, to get moving, to, to, to work on something, then, you know, you're at the level of, you, know, you need treatment. It's pathological. It's really interfering with your ability to, to be happy and to do things. But when you experience a circumstantial event, like you mentioned, initially you're set back. Initially, it may look the same. The first few weeks, like, oh, I can't get out of bed. This is devastating. I lost my job. I'm just miserable. And then you start to notice, like, wait, each day there's more energy here to do something. I'm still alive. I'm still here. What can I do with this? And you start to, to, to formulate a plan and you start to move in a direction. And that's, that's when you see someone you're sort of recovering from the initial hit. And that's when you say, oh, okay, it's not a pathological um, you know, condition. This person is functional. They need some help, but it's, it's very different in, in the way it looks. There was a, a gentleman I wrote about in the book who used to do stand-up. I don't know if you met him. He um, wasn't really active in too many of the clubs, but he was very funny. Uh, sadly depressed, really depressed. My brother-in-law introduced me to him and uh, he did even did a one man show hmm. called the uh, depression, the funny kind. And I saw it and I was like, God, this is great. I think you should do this on college campuses. Cause so much of it was about his time in college. And I try to hook him up with my agent and I was trying to give him all this motivation. And he was like in the moment, like, yeah, that's great. And then nothing would happen. Nothing. You know what I mean? It went nowhere. And I would talk to my brother-in-law and he'd say, he's just so depressed. He can't get out of bed. He can't function. It'd be wonderful if he could put that show on more, but he just can't. And you think, gosh, there it is right there. And then eventually, it sadly ended his own life um, several years back. Uh, and and that, that is it, so different from, from what we're talking about Pete, with people who right. are able to get up and start making change. Uh, you talk about being okay with a certain amount of, of disappointment. Find the suffering you're okay with in life. Give me examples, and why is this a good thing to, to, to be able to accept? Yeah, so Jerry Seinfeld was the one who said that in an interview, and it was like, kind of blew my mind, because I'm thinking, yeah, every, every job we do, there is a certain amount of, of suffering that we've got to deal with. And the, the question at the end of the day is, like, am I okay with this? So for me, traveling is one has always been one because as you go to live gigs get on planes you're in car you see disgusting things you're dealing with people that are yelling and and you're like at the end of the day the work is so valuable when i actually get there and i'm treated so well uh by people and, and audiences on average they're so nice to me uh and i leave feeling better about myself and maybe even the world if it goes well that yeah getting back on that disgusting plane you know is is worth it for me i can deal with that uh, there is some suffering, though, that crosses the line. I think if you're in a, a place where, you know, you don't feel appreciated ever, you walk in and you're just, you feel miserable, your boss is in your face all the time, it's stressing your life, and you don't want to get up in the morning, right? This is an example where the suffering has crossed over and has become toxic for you. You know, it's really interesting that you wrote this book a lot during the pandemic, right? You wrote a lot of it during the pandemic, and, and you, you include your own kind of uh, experiences, losing all of your work. Like, you know, you, you make most of your living speaking and uh, all of a sudden there's there's no theaters open. It's still coming back. But what do you think, Matt, of what has happened during this time in terms of the discoveries that human beings have made? Because you actually write a lot about that. It's just been wild to see, certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, tons of people outside at parks and playgrounds and and, and, and experiencing nature with their family at weird hours like you would never be doing that. And I, I have a lot of thoughts about this and I've talked about it a lot. But what, what has happened to us in, in, a, in, in many ways during this time? And will it will it will it sustain? I'm sure you've had guests on uh, historians, brilliant people who've talked about uh, pandemics from the past and how it's literally reshaped society. Yeah. And you, know, you look at this one and in the first few weeks, you know, people are out rollerblading, kids are playing basketball in the streets, people had afros because you couldn't get haircuts. You know what I mean? Just everything was like a throwback to the seventies, right? It was amazing. Um, and some people have embraced that need for vitamin N, right? That nature thing, that negative ions that exist in their highest in the mountains and at the beach and 
we breathe them in and they relax us and, 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 and less commuting, less time stuck, you know, stiff in your car. Oh, it's such a big deal. It's such a big deal. The less time commuting for me, I can't, I mean, I could talk about it for hours. Go ahead. Yeah. No, all these things, people got to witness them, not just for a few days, right. But for months and months. And now that things are starting to get back to normal, the question is, do people want to do it? Yeah. Well, guess what? We have a labor shortage and that's one of the reasons why I think people were like, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to be in my car for two hours round trip and be stuffed in some office. I'm looking for something better. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to, you know, find a Starbucks that's open in my town after three o'clock. Uh, but it's going to reshape us and, and it is reshaping us in, in major ways. I think the question is, are we going to listen uh, to ourselves and how much better we, we felt and follow that lead as opposed to, you know, oh, I got to make money again. I got to, you know, go back on that, that wheel treadmill, you know, the yeah, it's, hedonic it's, treadmill. Yeah, it's nuts. I mean, it's, it's just like, it's, we're all learning what's important, what makes us, what makes us happy or what makes us more relaxed, less anxious, less frustrated, uh, less, less negative and, and more positive. And I would think that that would, to some extent, sustain if you can make it work. It's just, I think it's hard to make it work. I think you can, you, you can know what works for you, but it's hard to pursue it. It's hard to balance it as well. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working a lot today and I'm not getting outside as much as I normally like to. And I'm not taking my long walk with my dog. But at the same time, Matt, I now look at the forecast and I think about doing more work on the colder, rainier, darker days so I can be more outside and usually doing work like you in my garden or walking the dog on the on the warmer, sunnier days. And that alone brings me great joy that I know I'll be able to experience the best of the of the best weather. Does that is that a good idea? Absolutely. I mean, think think about your life before your situation now, right? The, the, the nice day many times is lost on you. I was in, right? a, I was the nice, I was in a 37th floor sealed shut. If I wanted to get outside, I have to took an elevator all the way down and outside was cement city midtown in Manhattan. And the weird thing is as a comedian, you pursue a life that leads to a corporate media gig in midtown Manhattan and then you get it. And there are trade-offs. Yes. Isn't life disappointing that way, right? I mean, every comic desires a regular gig. You got it. And then it's like, wow, the things that actually make us happy, like you going out to your garden for an hour and nobody bothering you on a beautiful day in November, uh, you, you, know, you couldn't have that before. So your life is richer now. You're happier now. I know I am because I have my garden. And I do that all the time. And to me, it's just like when I'm on the road and stuck in a plane, the first thing I want to do when I get home after hugging my kids, of course, and my wife is bring me out to the garden. What can I pick? What can I pull just out here? Like this, this, this is where I want to be. It relaxes me. Um, and so having control over your schedule allows you more time to do those things. What is anxiety, especially for like, I don't know, say middle-aged men. What is it? What does it mean? How do you recognize it? We use that word. I think so much more, which is a good thing, but I, I feel like we're all overusing it be, or, or we don't, it means different things to different people. So when I say, oh, I got a lot of anxiety, you know, put it this way. I've got a lot of worries and I spend a certain amount of time worrying them. But then there are other people when I talk to them to say, dude, I'm just barely making it through the day every day. And I'm like, oh, so, you know, maybe that's more depression, but let's just stick to the anxiety for the middle-aged man. What are we talking about? It doesn't have to be gender, I guess, but talking to you, you're talking to me, <laughs> you know, it, it's a continuum, like everything else in psychology, it goes on this continuum right. of everyone's got a little bit of it. When, when a stressor hits, you're at the moderate level. Some people are extreme all the time. You know, you, you might look at these folks and say, wow, that's a panic disorder. Uh, if you want to label someone, that's somebody with OCD, right? Anxiety, OCD is an anxiety disorder where it's literally can be ruling their life with these rules. They've got to do certain things or else the world's going to collapse. But the average person who it certainly has every reason to be anxious during these days, um, you know, may very well be ruminating over things that are could happen. They could have cognitive distortions like uh, catastrophizing. Like my father, every day of his life, he was one of these guys who's like, I'm going to get fired. It could end tomorrow. And meanwhile, he had a great career, 30 years in Merrill Lynch, never got fired. But every day it was. Yeah, but forget about that award. Um, you know, tomorrow I could walk in and I got my bags packed, right? 
So for him, there was like this undercurrent of anxiety constantly ruminating about financial collapse. And he gave that to me. I mean, honestly, I inherited some of that. And the pandemic pushed me over the edge to the point where I realized like, oh, wait a minute. A lot of that rumination and anxiety was unproductive. And when the, when the, the S hit the fan, I don't know if we can swear on the podcast, Pete, but I, I, I would say this. Yes. <laughs> as, as when the shit hit the fan, uh, I realized like, oh my God, I'm actually a lot less nervous about this than I thought I was going to be. And that's, what's fascinating about going through a real disaster is like, well, we're, our brains, we, we thought we were just going to be a mess. And now I'm over here like, yeah, I'm all right. I'll be okay. Uh, I will out. say, I will say, you know, I always worry about losing that gig at Sirius because it was the greatest gig. I was making more and more money every contract. And at the end, you know, I was just so happy with where I got and created a channel. The show is perfect. The staff, like the team was great. It really was where it needed to be. And so then I worried about losing it even more. In the last year, I, I was pretty sure I might lose it because the writing was on the wall. Management had changed. They were programming changes. I'd lost favor with some of the executives, you know, uh, for fighting with them over Steve Bannon because I'm not an anti-Semite. But I started worrying more and more about losing it. I remember being on vacation and, and it was in the most beautiful place we'd ever been, Bermuda. And I, that was really, that was uh, maybe two months before I did lose. And I was almost positive at that point. And it was as bad as I thought it was going to be. And then it got worse because two weeks after I lost the gig, my dad had a heart attack. And I remember I fell to my knees. I was like, I don't have this type of skill set to recover. I don't have this type of resilience. I, I, I don't know what to do. And I've talked a lot about how I got through that, but it really was, it was worse than what I thought it would be. It was, my whole body was shaking. It, sh it vibrated to the point where I, you know, saw a couple doctors and I was convinced, I said to a neurologist, I have AIDS, MS, all the cancer. And he said, you, I'm sorry, I put you through a battery of tests. You have, you got anxiety. I mean, that's what you have. That's why you're shaking. You you're the perfect candidate for post-traumatic growth because the, the writers on this topic have said resilience is you bouncing back immediately, right? You get fired and the next day you're on the phone looking for the next gig and everything's fine. Everyone's like, wow, Pete, you're doing, you're doing great. That's resilience. You went through a trauma. We'll, we'll say a lowercase T trauma, right? You lose our job. It's different than trauma, like losing a parent. Yeah, yeah. Or, Fair, good. Right. But it's, it's trauma. Um, you experienced it, but then it took you a little time. I mean, it sucked. It hurt. It, you, like you said, the body resonating, maybe you woke up at four in the morning. Like I did the first two weeks after the shutdown. It's like, is this coronavirus or a panic attack? Right. You don't know. Every morning you're waking right. up with this chest <laughs> yeah. pain yep. and you're just not sure. Right. <laughs> that That's not resilience. That's you just definitely feeling it and not bouncing back right away. But then there was the growth phase and you, you demonstrated that beautifully. Um, and so what I'm saying is like, our brains have a, a, a limited capacity to predict our reaction. Now, sir, we predict the, the, the lying on the floor, but we think we're never getting out of that position, right. fetal position, right? But we do. We, many of us do. Thank you. If you're not depressed or have an anxiety disorder that prevents you from functioning, you're going to get off the floor and you're going to say, I'm still here. All right, let's, you know, what are we going to do now? Like, and you're, you're motivated. And that, that's really the, the crux of the second half of the title of the book. Like, you know, what does disappointment inspire? I had so many, I think I did have a certain, like I kept going, like I, I left Sirius XM HR and went straight to Katie Couric's office and met with Katie Couric. Nothing happened. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a great talk and a, a couple of things. She did actually publish a, a really important article, uh, which ties into it, uh, which was losing my job, save my marriage. And, you know, Val really helped me learn a uh, skill set in a way in a way to think. But I also never stopped moving. You know, I never stopped making phone calls and getting advice and talking, talking, talking and and doing everything that I possibly could to change my dynamic. While at the same time, totally catastrophizing. And I think the comedy comes in and in, in, in retrospect in thinking about all the other jobs, Matt, that I thought I would maybe you have to do. Um, and it, at its worst, it was, I could charge people for rearranging, organizing and decluttering their garage or something. That's what I was going to do for work I, to raise I, my kids. Yeah. That's what I was going to do. I was like, all right, that's a thing I'm, I'm, I've gotten decent at. I remember within a few weeks of the pandemic hitting my wife. Cause I, as you commented before we started, I have a Lululemon 
pull over here. My wife's gonna love, bash love her a Lulu man in a Lululemon. I got ever I got Lululemon underwear. You know, it's like I got Ooh. it all. Wow. I'm kidding. They don't make underwear. Uh, but, uh, damn it! I was jealous. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the thing is, within a few weeks of of all this happening, my wife said to me, like, "Look, I mean, Lululemon needs people to to fold the clothes if you're looking for." And I started to cry. I mean, here I am, like. I was working on ideas and what can we do in the book? Like maybe I should focus on that. And she's like, you know, they pay well over there. And it's just, it was hitting me. The reality yeah. of the thing was a lot to take in. Yeah. I mean, you have four degrees even more. Like it's, it's, uh, I don't know. How do, how do we get, how do we talk ourselves into I'm, I'm no good. I'm, I don't, nobody cares about anything I have to offer the world. I think that's a very middle-aged man thing. I, I heard about this a lot when I was younger and it is a thing. I mean, a lot of companies don't want to hire you. They certainly don't want to pay you what you need, uh, what you've mm-hmm. gotten used to, what you think you're worth. That happens a lot to people of a certain age. How do you get out of that? How do you talk yourself out of that? No, that, that's, that is a great question. You know, to me, in this world, we all need a niche, something that we're known for, something we have skills, special skills. And if you find yourself in a marketplace where you're a dime a dozen, and I think in some ways I felt that way doing stand up in clubs, as much as I thought I was unique, many club bookers saw me as another white guy coming in to tell jokes and we don't need you. And I got that sense from a lot of people. And then some comics felt like, well, you have all these degrees. You don't need this. You don't need to be here. So I felt like this sense of just middling right away. And I knew it was time for change. The disappointment of that, even if I had a great show, it just didn't seem like, Ooh, you know, there's some big opportunities happening yet in the speaking world, a speaker who's funny carried so much weight that it was like, Oh, we heard about you. You know, you get a call from somebody in a place you've never even heard of before because they're talking and they need someone like you. that's an indication. Like that's the direction you should be heading in because your skills are more valuable and you're probably going to end up making the kind of money that you need to make. So that's all I would say to someone sitting in that position where they feel like they're marginalized because of whatever reason, age, skill set. Um, it's definitely time to, to take your skills maybe to another place. Um, is, that, is that a helpful answer? That was, that was, that was unhelpful. Yes. <laughs> imagine. Imagine. No, that was an unhelpful answer. Uh, what about you write a lot about you write a lot about our, you know, our relationships with our screens. We can talk about our kids and and we can talk about our theories and we can talk about our anecdotes. But, you know, it still I, there still doesn't seem like there's a lot of research uh, and it does seem like mostly anecdotal. But most people do. I mean, how many times have we heard, you know, when I stopped, when I took Twitter off my phone, I felt better when I deleted my Instagram account. I got rid of my phone. Even some people are extreme. They get a flip phone and a, and they're just happier or they have more rules. I was talking to a good buddy of mine from high school. He's like, sorry, I don't chime in on our, our big text chat anymore as much, but I'm just, I'm really trying not to limit my screen time. You have a lot of thoughts. You write a lot about it. Tell me some. Yeah. I love that idea of, of moderation, us setting the rules, not having the, the phone chiming every time you get a text, but you look at it when you want to. And believe me, I, I look at it all the time still without the chiming, but at least I do it when I'm available mentally to do it. Because otherwise, your brain is responding to these chimes. Even if you don't look down at the phone, it is distracted to a certain sense. It interrupts your flow. If you're a creative person trying to write something, it definitely will take your mind out of it. But I'm not someone who says we got to get rid of all the devices. There's value to these things if we you know, are using them in ways that help us, not hurt us. So, for example, me going on Twitter after 11 o'clock at night, probably not a great idea. When your brain is tired, you're more emotionally reactive. You're going to see something on there. It's going to bother you. You oh, might yeah. be compelled to write something. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're trying to enjoy a moment with any other person, do not look at any social media because Twitter, some, some people say, I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Facebook or they're not. You're going to see, if you go on Facebook, somebody's dog or dad died. And if you go on Twitter, somebody's dog or dad died or a bunch of people died. If you're following like you are no longer present. And now you are affected, maybe you are, I certainly am, negatively by a thing you cannot control or do anything about at that moment. And now you've taken your attention away from the people or person that you're with. It's like so obvious that that happens. I don't need any, any study on that. That's happened to me so many times in my life. And it's really destroyed 
a lot of good, otherwise probably good moments or even days in my life. Sucks. Yeah, that's all we have are these big moments, right? And why would you want to take yourself out of it? I, I write about it in the book. I was on a speaking trip to uh, Chicago and I went to this great restaurant, Prateria Ricardo, I think it's called. And they had this saffron risotto. I know your wife's Sicilian, Pete. So um, if you bring her in here, we could talk about saffron risotto when it's made well, right? And I, it's got look, little veal meatballs in there. And it was so good, Pete. So good that I had to take a picture of it. And I'm like, I'm going to tell everyone about this. And I, I posted out to the Facebook and I said something like, all is right with the world. You know, I ate this incredible saffron risotto and I put in, in like parentheses like, yeah, until the next time I check my feed, my news feed. And sure enough, a minute later, as I'm looking to see who's responding, somebody posts a suicide note. A kid who'd seen me at a program, he's now like in his early 20s. And there it is. There's the note. And I'm like, look at this thing. Like, oh, my God, I, who is this kid? I don't know him. We, we got to get him help. And his friends are starting to chime in saying, we're looking for him. We call the cops and he's here. And thankfully he's okay. Right. But my mindset went from like, this is a big moment. What a great day. And now I'm like scared to death of this kid and um, stressing me out. I can't do anything about it. And thankfully it all was fine. But I'm thinking, man, that just changed everything for me. This green did it. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, those moments can happen in life. They're real life moments. Your kid's school calls and, you, you know, you, my my daughter, my daughter broke her arm one day at her friend's house. Well, that changed the trajectory of that day, you know, because I had to get an Uber to bring her to the hospital because I wasn't going to leave the interview I was doing. <laughs> can you she, get a uh, ride to the ER? <laughs> what, did you, what did you say? Can you get a ride to the ER? I'm interviewing an epidemiologist. You know how hard it was to book this? The point <laughs> being, your, 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 your life circumstances can, can change on a dime. We all know this uh, for any number of reasons, and they do. But when it comes to social media, that's you. Cho- like, you're forcing it. it. There are more contrived circumstances outside of your—I your, mean, you know, you think about Trump, four, four years of him— so many people were so traumatized by the repeated daily, uh, uh, multi times daily comments, things that he did, scandals. It was just, I don't know how to describe the psychological, the collective psychological impact of him being our president day to day. I don't know how to talk about it. You're dead on, though. It was, it was traumatic. Uh, it was like being in an abusive relationship. And the abuser is literally doing it for that reason to torment their opponents. Like, oh, this is a great thing. We're owning the libs. Or I heard that so many times. Yeah. And you'd think the recovery phase of it would be us saying, well, how do we prevent certain things from happening? The things that really terrified us the most. Uh, I don't know that we're seeing that kind of action right now. Uh, the shoring up certain uh, rules about, how about this? How about we do psychological profiles of everyone who even, you know, you know is going to run for president. You get that nomination. The world should really know, you know, what, what we're looking at here. Are you someone who's a sociopath, right? Are, are you capable of cruelty um, to others? Like this might be helpful in making your decision about who to vote for, but we're still recovering from it. And, and we're, we're trying to recover at the same time. We're still focused on the world having all these problems. So I, I feel like we haven't had a break yet entirely from the stress of, you know, all the things going on. You've uh, got all kinds of advice in this book, which is what I love of, of what we can do when life is a disappointment. Talk to me about some of the advice that you offer that each of us can, can insert into our daily practice from walking a dog to, to meditation, which I know you practice. Yeah. I started doing TM about five years ago and I didn't, realize how tired I was until I started doing it. But once I, it took about two weeks for my brain to realize like, Oh, this is about rest. And then I went to this deep place. It's the kind of sleep you get like three, four in the morning, that stage three sleep. And every day I I was getting that for 20 minutes and I was feeling my energy level come back. My mood was lifting. I was making better decisions. And when you really are dealing with true stressors, like the pandemic when it first hit, the ability to just give yourself this gift where I'm just going to sit down and power down my brain for 20 minutes. Gosh, it felt like a gift. Like, oh, good. This is just a break, a yep. reprieve from the storm. Um, and, and it also helped me practice settling those thoughts. So when, you, when you're waking in your waking hours, 
something hits you, like one of those moments where someone's in your face or, and rather than getting out of control, you see it, you, you sense it and you catch it and you just sort of calm it a little bit so that you're, you're responding, not reacting to it. So yeah, meditation has saved my life. And I don't say that lightly. What else? So not neglecting little things like, like meals. You know, I met a retired Navy SEAL for five years. They did post-deployment conferences for Navy SEALs and their families. I mean, I was around people that were like so impressive, but I was told not to like, you know, blow smoke up their ass or kiss their butts or anything like that. Just be you like, just act like these are not these SEAL team six walking around here. Right. And one of the guys I met was a, a retired SEAL named Wally Graves. And uh, I, we became close and I was like, Hey, how did you get through that grueling, you know, six month training? And he said, Matt, I just told myself, don't quit until after a meal. I was like, wow, that's interesting. I'm going to see that coming. Wait, really? Why is that? Well, it t- turns out, you know, you eat dopamine levels go up. He was eating around his, you know, his buddies and, and just that camaraderie, both those two things together suddenly changes your outlook, right? So how many of us skip meals? I'm going to eat my car. I'm going to, I'm not going to have dinner. I'm th- these things erode our mental health. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good, that's a sort of, I didn't know you did that. You, know, you wrote about it in the book, but with the Navy SEALs, it must've been a really a fascinating thing just studying their practices every day and how they compartmentalize whatever the hell's going on with them. And then how they don't actually so often veterans, especially deal with what they experience or, or what they, what they see. What about writing? Writing therapy is so effective, especially for young people, but anyone really. And I demonstrated with the book, you know, my dad passed, I was probably like three chapters in and, uh, you know, pandemic hits and it's like, God, I have another chapter to write. Ugh. My dad falls, he's dying after another chapter. I'm never going to finish this book. All these things are piled upon me. What I noticed within a few weeks of my dad passing, I couldn't write enough. Five hours a day, give me five more. Before he passed, it was hard to find the time. But ther- therapeutically speaking, here's what's great about writing. There's nobody between you and the page. It's just you expressing this stuff, formulating it, processing it, um, looking at it, stepping away from it, coming back to it. Our communications with other people, as wonderful and supportive as it can be, can sometimes be sidetracked by the other person's agenda or a bad listener or just, you know, life circumstances don't allow you to talk for three hours. But when you can can commit to writing something long form, there's nothing. It's like those long car rides we used to have doing stand up gigs. Remember the conversations you have in those long car? It's like, why were those so great? Because you had hours and nothing to do. And we're just talking and, and now we're really getting deep and, the, and writing therapy is very similar. Men, I like to journal. I think it's been uh, one of the most important things I've, I've done. I do it on and off. I'm not consistent about it, but that is another thing that men seem to think is somehow not manly or, or weak or, or can't do it. Uh, and I just only want to submit one thing before I get your, your take on it. But uh, it's not about the the writing. Like you don't have to be a good writer. I'm not a great writer. Anybody that's ever seen my writing knows that. But I love to write down my thoughts and and my experiences, my emotions, my confu all of it. It's super helpful to me. And what do you what specifically do you think about journaling, especially for dudes who look at it as somehow I don't know unorthodox. You know, you don't have to produce this thing to publish it, right? It could be you produce this writing that maybe you have a few stories for a party. You know, you go to parties that you go to. It could be jokes in your case. I'm sure your journaling has led to funny lines that just popped up and you're like, oh, I got to try that. So the value in the, in, the, in the writing can be many forms. It doesn't have to just be in a finished work that, you're, that the world is going to read from beginning to end. So keep that in mind. Like it could just be a very internal thing where you now see certain uh, disappointments as opportunities to write about it. Like, oh, that's interesting. I, I immediately see the value in what I just went through. Um, I can write it down. And, and, and that's a, a benefit to you. So I hope the people listening can say, look, there's more to this than producing some paper that's going to be criticized by people. Yeah, no, the, the, no one ever has to see it. I like to brag in my journal. Yeah, <laughs> really? Give me an example. I just like to talk about, you know, something that I've accomplished, some, somebody that I've, I've, I've talked to that I'm impressed, you know, being impressed with myself. Cause I think, you know, like I, when I, when I brag or when I get arrogant, I usually try to do it somewhat tongue in cheek. 
But, Mm -hmm. you know, I like to really hit it on the nose and talk about how proud I am of myself in my journal. Otherwise, it seems kind of unbecoming. You know, there's a a balance between confidence and and arrogance, I suppose. And uh, so that's my my safe space because I do the obvious things in there. I complain, I question, I everything I write about just the mundane. But I also I'm like, I'll get high on myself sometimes, too. Well, you have you have a social awareness that says, hey, maybe this is safer in my journal. Yeah. There's a guy on my block, by the way, when the pandemic hit, here's an example of lack of social awareness. He comes up to me, he's younger than me. And he goes, uh, gosh, man, I, you lost your business. Well, you know who you can turn to if uh, you ever need any money, right? And I was like, uh, my parents? He goes, no, me. I'm like, you? I'm like, he's like a middle manager at a pharmaceutical company. I don't know what that, I'm like, uh, okay, uh, thanks, I guess. It was the most arrogant thing. I've ever seen. And, and I was like, well, maybe he just thinks he's being helpful, but like you, you don't come up to someone and say those words, right? You could do that. I, I kind of want a neighbor who's just going to, I don't know that well, but like, dude, if you need any money, let me know. If, if it was that smooth, I would have been <laughs> like, I get it, right? Yeah. But this, I wish you would have been there, Pete. It was one of those moments where you're like, oh my God, who's <laughs> this guy? Like, granted, if he's like related to a, Rockefeller or something. And he's like, look, my wife's loaded. If you need any money, you know, like that, it wasn't that it was like, yeah, you come, you come to me. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> yeah, no, guy. that's uh, and just bragging about money in, in general is just such a, such a weird thing to do, but uh, we do it. We do it a lot. Listen, man, I know you got to go. I really appreciate you talking to me. Uh, let's, let's continue the conversation when I'm done with the book. I hope everybody gets it. Life is disappointing and other inspiring thoughts and all the links to Matt's work in today's show notes uh but matt bellis b-e-l-l-a-c-e on all the social media and dot com so great to talk to you about the book but more importantly just awesome to catch up with you buddy it's so great to see you and and hear you and uh i i I love it i really appreciate you thanks for having me on pete i really enjoyed it I did too. There he goes. That's Matt Bellis, B E L L A C E, on line, mattbellis.com, at Matt Bellis on social media. Definitely go check this book out. Go check out all of Matt's work. Life is Disappointing and Other Inspiring Thoughts. I really enjoyed reading it and certainly enjoyed talking with him and look forward to doing it again. Thank you to Michael Cohen, Dr. Megan May, and Dr. Matt Bellis. And thank you for subscribing to this podcast with a paid subscription. If you do already, I love you. Thank you so much month after month. I can't thank you enough. You can always edit your pledge up if you want to support the show more. You can, as people do. And uh, a lot of people have done that. All those people should get thank yous as well when that happens but i'm just a little disorganized trying to keep track of it i call it subscriber relations trying to stay in touch with you guys and get to know you guys i love it feel like i've got hundreds of friends so i hope to see you tomorrow night on the hangout if you're a new subscriber and if not subscribe now patreon.com slash pete dominic we're working on figuring out how to get a gift subscription many of you have asked about that for those of you who can't afford the five dollars a month that we're trying to figure that out. So some of you who can, can help them out and they can join us in our community and get all the uh, extra access that comes with it. Cause you're never alone. If you're a member of our community, we've always got the discord platform going and so many different ways to contribute to the show that we make happen every single day. So let me know, stand up with Pete at gmail.com to get a hold of me or DM me on my Twitter. It's a good way to get a hold of me as well. So that is it. I've got to go. And now it's time to let John Carroll sing us out. You can find me in the woods with Dr. Ken Zatz tomorrow morning. Today? I mean, today. Yeah, let's pretend that it's not Tuesday night when I'm taping the introduction. Have a great day. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Stand off ground and that's